Next, a hearing on the administrative operation of the House of Representatives. Members of the House Oversight Committee look at plans to change postal offices, downsize several House operations, and to modernize computer technology. California Congressman Bill Thomas chairs the four-and-a-half-hour hearing. An oversight will uh, come to order. Uh, this is one of those days in which a number of um, subcommittees are meeting and uh, members uh, will be coming and going. However, all members have been provided uh, with the materials prior to uh, the committee uh, hearing and there has been uh, some response uh, between members. We will uh, move forward with today's agenda uh, and there may be some slight pauses as members are coming from the Rayburn or the Cannon Building where other subcommittees uh, are currently meeting in which they have either a work product or votes are taking place uh, as well. So we will, uh, in the context uh, of understanding that members are very, very busy, uh, move forward with this very important um, final uh, agenda uh, change, which although not completely uh, final, clearly uh, represents uh, the culmination of an effort that began uh, the day after uh, the election when the Republicans for the first time in 40 years were uh, named a majority, one of the things you do in any operation, business, government, uh, or, or even uh, in moving, uh, is to uh, go through uh, what you have, decide what you're going to keep, and what you're going to change. Uh, clearly, uh, after uh, 40 years, uh, there were a number of things, uh, just uh, by the sheer fact of, uh, of years, uh, that needed to be changed. Uh, but more fundamentally than that, uh, when the Republicans took over, uh, not actually uh, until January 4th, but uh, clearly based upon the election, uh, Speaker Gingrich named uh, Congressman uh, Jim Nussel, uh along with a transition team through November uh, and December uh, to uh, examine rethink and propose a plan for the restructuring uh, of the House. On December 1st of last year, uh, Chairman Nussel announced the transition's plans for a quote-unquote open house. And he used three uh, key words in describing an open house, accountability, responsibility, and accessibility. I think, though, that I would add a, a fourth term uh, to those three which is becoming more apparent, and that is transparent. Uh, we uh, are in the final phases of uh, the first ever financial and operational audit of House operations. It will provide the shareholders, if you will, the American taxpayer, with a full comprehensive report on the People's House. Uh, the final results of that audit uh, will be uh, presented uh, to us and the public uh, in early uh, July. Uh, we do have um, an understanding of the direction that the audit is going, uh, and clearly we do not want to get uh, out in front of the audit, and we believe uh, that the uh, reforms proposed today uh, will be in concert uh, with that audit. On January 4th, uh, this committee, the Oversight Committee, uh, created uh, uh, by the new majority with a fundamentally different uh, work task clearly spelled out by its name. It is the successor to the uh, uh, old uh, committee that was supposed to look at the specific details uh, uh, in terms of the way in which the House operates and we have transitioned to a House Oversight Committee uh, with a broad policy responsibility. That broad policy responsibility is represented in no better way than the resolutions that are in front of us today to set in motion a series of changes uh, which we will monitor uh, and respond to only uh, when needed. Uh, the items that we're looking at today obviously don't end 
this transition period. Uh, but they clearly create um, benchmarks uh, in this transition period. Uh, with the action today, we will have within a 180-day period uh, reformed the fundamental institutional aspects of the House, focusing on the combination of the Sergeant at Arms and the doorkeeper, the clerk of the House, and an office that was created uh, relatively short time ago, the Chief Administrative Officer or the CAO, uh, with a uh, significantly uh, expanded role in dealing with the institutional aspects uh, of the House. At our last meeting, you recall, we examined uh, actions to privatize the beauty in the barbershops, open up two uh, parking lots to the public. Uh, those uh, were important measures. But for the ongoing uh, operation of the House, today's uh, agenda is uh, far more uh, ambitious. Uh, these past months have been difficult. Uh, clearly, they've been filled with uncertainty for uh, many House uh, employees, perhaps uh, more unnecessarily uh, uh, than would have been the case. Our goal is to make sure that in this transition period, with an understanding to produce a house which is accountable with responsibility and accessible and transparent, that those changes take place in a way that understands the fact that we're dealing with people, their careers, uh, and that it is a very traumatic time. No reorganization, whether it's public or private, is easy. Um, and I want to thank everyone uh, for their patience, including the press. Uh, it was uh, perhaps far more uh, difficult and complicated than we thought uh, when we began. Uh, what we've tried to do is to restructure the House following those uh, criteria uh, in the best interest of the House and in the interest of the American taxpayers who ultimately have to pay our bills. But I think it's also noteworthy to indicate that the very first resolution uh, that we will be addressing is a resolution to authorize employee training uh, and outplacement uh, services and understanding that we are dealing uh, with ultimately people. That any institution, although we get into the structure and function and flow chart and boxes of responsibilities, is ultimately uh, people. Uh, and we have a responsibility to the American taxpayer and we have a responsibility to the people who uh, assist us here on the uh, Hill as well. With that, I would uh, recognize uh, the ranking uh, member, the gentleman from California. Well, first, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff for uh, the very hard work that you've put into the review and analysis of the various proposals to improve and reform this institution. I also want to thank you for the very open manner in which you've communicated with the minority on these issues. I think we've had uh, a good deal of input on the topics that will be before us today, and I want to thank you for that. As I indicated in my remarks before the last full committee hearing, the implementation of various administrative reforms should go hand in hand with a constant process of testing our conclusions against certain fundamental principles. Well-conceived and well-managed reform measures will greatly improve the services, increase the efficiency, and hopefully provide economies throughout the operations of the House. With these goals in mind, we have previously instituted a number of improvements in House operations. And it's clear that this Congress, the 104th, will significantly expand that effort. In achieving such positive changes, we should expect to better address the needs of our constituents, but at the same time, make sure we continue to preserve the essence of this great institution in which we're also privileged to serve. But we must take care that we do not produce unintended consequences, undesired results, kind of a legislative Murphy's Law. Change for change's sake frequently results in a cure that's worse than the disease. And taxpayers should note that so-called reform will often cost money, even where some economies are claimed. It's therefore imperative that the committee carefully review all the proposals regarding changes in the House and satisfy ourselves that the following questions have been satisfactorily addressed. First, is the underlying purpose of the change sound? Second, have we fully explored all reasonable alternatives and have they been accurately costed out so the taxpayers' money will be efficiently invested for the long term 
And third, has full consideration been given to adversely affected employees? In many ways, change is inevitable. I believe it's our responsibility, however, to shape any proposed change to ensure that it effectively and economically fulfills its intended purpose. In shaping these changes, one of the principal concerns should be how they impact people, both the taxpayers in our districts and the other group of taxpayers at issue here, namely those working men and women who have served this institution and its members so ably for so many years. While staffing reductions may be necessary to some degree, we should take care to see that the hardworking folks who are adversely affected are treated with the respect, concern, consideration they deserve for their dutiful service to the House. We should avoid any unwise, short-sighted staffing reductions, but where necessary, we should ensure fairness and provide assistance to all those who may be displaced in our reform process. The other side of that coin is that we should assure fairness in the hiring of staff who will manage these reforms. And that gives rise to issues of hiring practices, the specter of unwarranted political patronage, and the question of employee qualifications. Certainly, if we're serious about improving the functioning of this institution, we should see to it that hiring and firing decisions are based on an appropriate professional criteria and not the exclusive product of political partisanship under the guise of so-called reforms. Another area of interest to many of us is the manner in which costs are being shifted from the CAO's budget directly to the members' constituent service budgets and the impact of this cost. Members' ability to serve their constituents needs to be kept preeminent. To the extent costs are being shifted, and I note there is not a corresponding increase in members' office accounts, we need to do so for clear and deliberate policy reasons with full recognition of the consequences. And furthermore, as more costs are shifted to member constituent service budgets, we should expect a higher average member expenditure from the underlying appropriations account. The current level is 92.5 percent. Uh, the constituent service budget is never fully subscribed at the authorized level. But I think we'll see an increasing reliance on that. And if that level goes up and the appropriations are insufficient to cover the shortfall, I think we have to look to the CAO to either help us pick up the difference or certainly explain why we ran short and what solutions, what alternatives there may be. As he indicated at the last committee meeting, I have some reservations about proceeding with certain reforms at this time. We are investing in costly third-party analysis of the House functions, as the chairman has said, going through the first uh, of a series of audits initiated in the last Congress, coming to fruition in this one. It seems to me that by proceeding with all of the CAO's proposed reforms without benefit of an overall strategic plan, we may be putting the cart before the horse. Nonetheless, as we proceed with various reforms, we should all remember that what's at stake is the health of this institution and the needs of the country and the ability of members to serve their constituents come before other priorities. So above all, as we make these changes, let us take care to do the job right, because I sense that it will not be reversed and undone in future Congresses, regardless of who will be in charge. I think these are reforms that ought to stand the test of time and partisan change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for his statement. Uh, for operating procedures, uh, I want to um, outline uh, this procedure, and I hope it's satisfactory. Uh, in terms of the resolutions, although all of the members received them ahead of time, I think it's useful to do a brief review so that we can focus on the particular resolution. Uh, Chief of Staff Stacy Carlson will do an outline of the resolution. Uh, the Chief Administrative Officer, Scott Faulkner, and he will then introduce periodically individuals under his operation who will assist us in briefly fleshing out uh, what the resolution means. Uh, we'll then turn to a discussion and members can uh, ask uh, questions and then I'll call on particular members uh, to offer the resolution. Gentleman from Kansas wish to make a statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would only ask the Chairman's preference. I do have a short statement. I can make it part of the record or, uh, or make a brief statement. It's the, it, it's the Chair's call. Uh, it would be the Chair's desire that it be made a part of the record and any other opening statement that any member has uh, be made a part of the record. We're probably going to hear a lot from a lot of members today. Thank the gentleman. I chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Employee Assistance. 
Uh, Ms. Carlson, would you give us a brief uh, outline of that resolution? This resolution would authorize the chairman to provide such sums as necessary from the current CAO budget for training and outplacement services for displaced employees and to continue the authorization for lump sum payments of earned accrued leave to those employees and to allow the officers of the House to employ temporary and part-time employees. It would also require the CAO to report to the committee monthly by the 10th of the month on the status of, of carrying out this resolution. Mr. Faulkner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy Flag Day to everybody. The, uh, the whole issue before us today, not only on this resolution but, but other ones, is that the Congress or the House side in administrative staffing to provide administrative services over the last few decades, and really in some cases the, the last century, was to staff at the maximum level necessary to meet the peak demand. What we've been finding in the last six months of analysis is that the workflows tend to be far short of that peak demand. In fact, they're highly erratic. And what we've been dealing with is incredibly high fixed costs with this flux of work uh, not ever really justifying that high fixed cost. Therefore, what we've been looking at is a series of reforms that allow us more flexibility in meeting the members' needs and adjusting resources to meet that ebb and flow of needs. The first piece to this, as Ms. Carlson mentioned, is to relate to the people themselves. Any change is difficult. It's very complex. The issue of changing an operation as complex and as intense as this House of Representatives is, is like changing tires in a bus going 90 miles an hour. You can't pull it over to the side of the road and change tires. You have people working. You have members and staff and visitors and constituents needing their needs met sometimes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this first resolution addresses some of the issues regarding the flexibility needed to hire the proper expertise when that expertise is needed. It is also addressing the issue of individuals who have worked loyally for the Congress for many years, in many cases nearing retirement, and how to address their needs as the new structure displaces some of them. The, what we have tried to do is to create a transition structure so that people who are nearing retirement can retire as scheduled, people who may be within a few years of retirement may pursue buyouts where people who have skills that may be shifted to other parts of the organization may shift accordingly and people who still need strengthening of certain skills either to remain within the structure of Congress, and this means not just the House but the Senate, the GAO, the GPO, Library of Congress, Architect of the Capitol, be able to shift and compete for jobs there but also to compete elsewhere in the private sector or in the government sector. And this has required a lot of research. We have worked very diligently to reach out to large industries that have downsized over the last few years, looking at the kind of employee retraining, employee counseling, and employee outplacement services that they've been providing. We've talked to numerous outplacement firms that provide such services to get an understanding of the state of the art. We have talk to members of Congress who have districts that have, uh, have had large-scale uh, outplacement or downsizing of corporations within their, uh, their districts. And what we think we've shaped up here is a proposal that addresses the human side of the issue, that we do not want to see anyone on the street that has served their country loyally and faithfully. We feel that there is a moral obligation and a professional obligation to make sure that if a person is displaced that every opportunity to, to move them into a productive role elsewhere in the congressional complex is made and if that role isn't found that they are properly prepared to compete elsewhere. And so I'll turn things over to Kay Ford, my associate administrator for personnel, 
our human resources to be able to uh, talk a little bit more in detail. Uh, I, we have prepared a, a pretty um, well-rounded uh, program for uh, the uh, displaced employees. Uh, we already have an employee of, uh, Office of Employee Assistance, which will be on hand to provide the uh, personal consultation, the coping with career uh, change. They're maintaining their support, These microphones are terrible, oh. so you need to oh. talk directly. Okay. I don't know about the media that are attached to it, but it's the silver one in the center that's the one that we need to hear. We'll have one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations, uh, personal consulta consultations and assessments, uh, seminars on coping with transition and career changes, uh, dealing with stress, maintaining their self-esteem, uh, basic financial planning and transition support seminars and referral services. These are available to the employees as of right now they will be available to the employees and their families after they have uh, left the House of Representatives service. This is an ongoing service that we already provide employees. Uh, as for the Human Resources Office of Personnel and Benefits, we will have in-depth uh, consultations as much as is needed, group briefings uh, for their uh, employee benefits, uh, includes uh, employment compensation, accru their accrued leave, their health benefits, their life insurance, retirement, and thrift savings, and what entailed, all is entailed in that. And some of these people might be uh, eligible under the RAMSPEC Act to go into other government agencies. We will uh, do in-house and also uh, with contractors, we'll have uh, general aptitude testing, uh, skills assessment, and then general outplacement and career uh, services. Uh, we will work with them to um, do a skills assessment. Uh, prepare their work history, a resume, whatever is needed for them, teach them to go out and interview uh, for jobs, how to market their skills that they have, manage in the transition, and just basically how to fill out a, a job application, new workforce. And also we are planning to have a uh, computer literacy introductory and basic PC, PC skills course to get these people up to date on the modern technologies that exist. And uh, we will also have a resource center that will be available to them with uh, copy machines, fax machines, computers, so that they can uh, work on this. And this will be available to them after they leave service here. I think we uh, really have met the needs of what people need. Comprehensive program. Yes. Um, at this point, any members who have uh, questions or wish to discuss the resolution before us? Gentlewoman from Washington. Mr. Chairman, I would just say that I want to commend the CAO for its sensitivity in offering this sort of training. I, I would like to ask one question. How much uh, has this kind of training and outplacement service been utilized in the past, and are the employees generally happy with uh, what it offers? I don't actually don't think that much of the service had been offered in the past, but I'll let Kay talk to it. I, uh, we have uh, the employee assistance as an ongoing program, and it is very utilized. It's a very active office. Uh, in the pro after the um, before the transition, before we came on, they did have some outplacement people in here. I don't know the success of that. I don't have the numbers, but they did. That was provided. Good. Good. Thank training. you, Mr. Chairman. But no training in house has really been done. This is so this is additional yes. that you're adding. The in house, okay. yes. Good. Thank you. Chairman, I uh, wanted to indicate that I think this is uh, important and probably more timely now because for the first time in many years uh, we are letting people go and in large quantities and I think it is a uh, hopefully humane approach to doing it. I think that uh, we have probably operated here without a great deal of change in the number of people on our staff for at least 15 years uh, and there hasn't therefore been that much turnover prior to retirement. So in this new environment, we have a new need, and I'm glad that we are at least beginning to, to plan for the provision of these benefits, these services to our employees. They do deserve them, and they will need them. I think we have an awful lot of people who, if we go forward with all of these changes, are going to be put out into the economy without uh, the skills to fully compete in the job market and many of them have had uh, relatively decent benefits as federal employees here that uh, may not be available to them in the private sector certainly health care and the kind of pension benefits they've had here so uh, to the extent that we can help people 
those who have to leave leave with some skills that would augment their opportunity to get hired, that's all to the better. I would simply, however, because this is a new area, ask that we do some requirements of the CAO that would allow us to understand just what we're doing and how often we're doing it and what the results have been. I think we need to do some evaluation of the intent. I mean, this uh, is something that we're probably replicating from a Fortune 500 kind of background. I'd like to, to the extent this committee can provide oversight, actually understand not only what we're doing but what the results have been. I think we owe that to the general taxpayers as well as to those other employees who may need these uh, services and benefits in the future. To comment Any other member? Uh, no comment? Yeah, certainly uh, we are very uh, interested in making sure that what efforts we do make are uh, are well documented and also the impact is well documented. As we've said many times uh, in this forum, you know, we're committed to continuous improvement and the one way to continuously improve is to understand the impacts of what we're doing and to make changes and adjustments as we go along so that every individual we help, every situation we work on it builds on the last. So we welcome that uh, continued dialogue and we'll, continue, we'll definitely provide those kinds of numbers. And I would indicate to the um, gentleman from California that in the resolution itself, uh, in the second uh, for, uh, resolved, further second resolve clause, uh, that the uh, chief administrative officer is authorized and directed to carry out the various activities that have been discussed, subject to the approval of the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member, and we will continue that working relationship as we examine the options. This is an area that all of us are concerned about, uh, and it rightfully comes first on the agenda. Gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask on the resolution uh, providing for sums as necessary from current CAO budget. Uh, do you have an estimate of what sums will be necessary? We're uh, trying to do a lot of it in house. We have uh, gotten services from the District of Columbia, with they, which they do not charge for. We're hoping to keep it under $50,000. There will be some uh, outplacement things that we'll have to pay for out of pocket, but a lot of it be done in-house. Uh, your projection is no more than $50,000? No, no more. And how many people does that contemplate extending services to? Uh, less than 200. It's not, it's going to be provided to people that want it. It's not going to be mandatory. It's a voluntary effort on their part. So who, whoever wants it will uh, receive it. And the 50000 does not include the in-house resources. No. This would be just extra resources that we might have to contract for since we don't have a full range of in-house training capability. So the, the 50000 would be paid to vendors outside for the delivery of services for these employees. Yes. Uh, is there any provision, I uh, look, Mr. Chairman, quickly, and I frankly haven't read the resolution uh, slowly. Uh, I think we just got this resolution. Uh, any event, I haven't read it. With respect to folks that were let go in December of last year and January of this year, would they be uh, uh, eligible for any services uh, that might be available through this? As we are coming to the committee here today for authorization to, to do these things, uh, it'll be up to the committees, to the forum here to add any retroactivity. I, I might add that they have been available, the employee assistance program has been available to those people and they have been using the employee assistance office and it was since 2010. That this would apply not only to CAO employees but to Clerk of the House, Sergeant at Arms, and to anyone, you know, former employee of the Congress, that was at least the staff's intent that this is open and if someone requests it, we would provide it. it would so that former employees would be eligible? Yes, that was our intent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's intended to be a resource that will be ongoing, although front loaded because of the changes that, frankly, was, uh, was needed for some time. The difficulty, of course, is that the old process was you were hired on the basis of patronage, you retained on the basis of patronage, and you lost your job by the defeat or retirement of your benefactor. And there wasn't this ongoing skills process. Our hope is 
that not only will this be a useful resource during this very difficult time, but for people who want to advance themselves, these kinds of programs are useful almost as an in-service training arrangement for people who voluntarily avail themselves uh, of it. Uh, gentleman from Louisiana. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask a question about um, the content of these programs or how they were put together and uh, whether they're modeled after any successful I'm talking mostly here about the training and retraining programs. Mm -hmm. Is there some successful model that we are replicating here, or is this something that is being invented uh, uh, in, uh, by you uh, without uh, reference to a, uh, a, a model that has been successful? Uh, our research spanned a wide range of service and industrial outplacements that have occurred in the last few years that have all been deemed successful by the outplacement uh, community. And we've gone to some of the leading firms within the outplacement vending community to ask them for, for their input. So we are not lifting one program out of one company, but rather pulling together practices and services that we have... Can you give an example of these companies, who they were and what... Uh, one would be Manchester, which is a large company based on the East Coast that has done, uh, did mobile oil and did several other uh, large companies like that in the last few years. They're one did of the they leading deal firms. With I'm sorry. Okay. Did they deal with employees who had the skill level of employees here? Yes, because uh, like in mobile oil we're dealing with uh, blue collar workers as well as uh, white collar workers. How available is this training uh, going to be? Uh, uh, how much time is, is, is uh, contemplated to be invested in a particular employee for training and how much time for counseling? And uh, if it's, is, is there's a time point at which they use it up and they're done? Uh, how does it work? That will be up to the employee as needed by the employee. It's, this is a voluntary uh, effort on behalf of them and as much services as needed. As I said, Employee assistance has been helping people that were in the transition in December. This is an ongoing process. We will not have one and size fits all. We're going to talk to each employee that, again, is on a voluntary basis and try to craft a program of support and retraining that will fit the employee and the, and the job market research we've done. Uh, as uh, Kay Ford said, we are not looking at <coughs> saying that after two days or two hours it's over. We will support every employee as long as they feel the need for that support. How did you arrive at the 200 uh, number that you talked about a minute ago, of the uh, projected that you think uh, will be the number of employees who will want to avail themselves of, uh, are you talking about 200 who will want to avail themselves of counseling or, or training or both? Or? 200 for training. 200 for training. How do you arrive at that? Uh, we took uh, the approximate number of people that might be displaced. What was that number? Uh, that, Mr. V, uh, that would not be under my area. You'd have to talk to... Approximately 270. Yeah. And uh, a percent, not everyone will want to do, do the uh, training, I'm sure. And we, we can, I think we kept a high number. I think that's high. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with you also that... Uh, I think we need to ensure that our employees who have been here for many years, and in most cases, that uh, we mitigate as much of the negative impact that they will have, their families will have. I've been through a couple of rifts in uh, the public sector, and uh, as, as much as we try to make them as whole as possible, uh, sometimes we uh, don't quite get there. And so it's in the interest of the employee that, uh, especially good employees that have been with us for uh, many years. Uh, in, in your resolution, uh, you talk about the availability of counseling, retraining, and outplacement services. Let me, I, I heard you say that uh, we're going to deal with the stress factor. Uh, we're going to deal with uh, the family in, in terms of uh, economic planning. Uh, so you will have those symposiums. Uh, what about individual counseling to the particular employee? Are, are you taking that into account? That, that has been available. It's an ongoing program here that is available to every employee in the House of Representatives and their families and after they leave the House of Representatives. That has been an ongoing program here. To, now, when you talk about after they leave service, approximately 
What length of time will those services be available to the employee or to the family after they've gone? Do you have any idea of what? That's, uh, employee assistance does not have a cutoff date. We do not cut people off. If they need help, we help them. In, in the area of retraining, uh, one of the problems that we're going to find ourselves in, that many of these employees, and 200 is not a, a large number. I mean, 200 uh, persons, is, if we do it right, is not a, a big number, and I think we can handle it. In, in the retraining, uh, we're going to find ourselves that, because they've been here for a long time, and probably uh, did uh, a few jobs that required not too many skills, we're going to find that the employees may not have uh, the skills that are needed in the economy around D.C. The problem that I find myself with is that, uh, first of all, the D.C. government itself is down, downsizing, so you're, you're going to have uh, limited abilities to find employment there, which many of these people would have gone to. And also, uh, the unemployment rate is, is high in D.C., uh, you also have the federal government, the other main employer, also downsizing. So as you assess the individual's skill, what are you retraining them to in what type of employment when you may find that employment out of this sector is either limited or not available? The main issue is that, we've, uh, that we are recognizing that you don't do a one-size-fits-all training to a job market that may not exist. I mean, that would be a tremendous disservice. And again, we've met with a number of members of Congress who've had major companies in their districts downsized to get their ideas on that subject. We're focusing a lot on the congressional campus itself. Again, the House, the Senate, Library of Congress, Architect of the Capitol. There are thousands of positions that come open on an ongoing basis. In fact, on the House side alone among members' offices, there's about a 40 percent turnover each year in staff. We're doing tremendous outreach going back several months now with the Systems Administrator Association, the Administrative Assistance Association, Legislative Assistance Association, looking at job trends. We've worked very closely with the Congressional Management Foundation to get their uh, data on the evolving job markets and expanding job areas throughout the Congress. Uh, we ha continue those dialogues on an ongoing basis because what we want to do is make sure that we can come back to this committee uh, one month, two months, six months from now and be able to have a very uh, comprehensive picture of where these individuals have ended up and hopefully showing a, a very uh, good p profile of, of placement. We are going very proactive on our outplacement office. We're going to be having job fairs. We're going to be we're actively already reaching out to, to numerous uh, other potential employers in the D.C. area to find out what their needs are going to be and working backwards from that, structuring training programs to reflect the job market. Again, we, we care about these employees as well. They're, they're our employees as well. They, they're on our payroll. And we want to make sure that, uh, that the loyalty they have displayed to the Congress over the years is returned. Well, one of the problems that I find as I went through some of the material that uh, you're talking about many of these employees, uh, their tenure with, uh, with us may be only two months at the most, uh, half of June, uh, maybe July, and part of August. And if you're taking someone on their particular needs, not one, one uh, form fits all, mm -hmm. and you're talking about 200 people, that you may find yourself that the plan that you want to implement, which we all would agree is probably one that we all want to see, mm -hmm. that you don't have the luxury of time to assess your skills, find out what's available in the job market, which is very limited just due to the economy, mm -hmm. and be able to make meaningful placement of these people. So could it be that your time limit or that you've placed on yourselves may be unrealistic. The state of the art in outplacement these days does have quick turnarounds. There are survey vehicles that literally can be done. I have one in front of me here from this one company we've been talking to, Career Search, that literally it's a half hour questionnaire relating to aptitudes. You also give a Myers Briggs test, which is a personality and uh, a test relating to uh, basically how people 
behave with other people. And the combination of the two creates an incredibly comprehensive package. This has been used in many, uh, in high schools. I mean, the issue is, is that you obviously do one-on-one -on -one discussions, but there are psychological tools that are used in large industries that have been pr proven. Mr. Falker, I, I beg to differ with you. You can assess them psychologically, you can assess, assess their attitudes, but it's their job skills and the jobs that are available. Right. And, I'm, and well, I, uh, my, my problem that I have, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, you may be boxing yourself into a very short period of time with people of very low skills with very few jobs available. And uh, you can test them to death and uh, counsel them to death, but you may be, uh, I, I wish you success. I mean, what I'm telling you is that maybe mm -hmm. uh, your, your goals and your objectives uh, may be a little restrictive and unreasonable, but uh, I, I hope you, you do that. My, my last question deals with outplacement services. The, the only way I think we're going to be successful with the situation as it is in terms of the skills of the employees and the type of jobs out there is if your department or the personnel department, uh, beyond having them fill out the resumes and, and beyond uh, uh, counseling them that you take a very aggressive role mm -hmm. in <clears throat> seeking employment and basically uh, finding the opportunities and and uh, setting in many cases appointments for them and, and being uh, proactive mm -hmm. because I think that's where the success is going to be mm -hmm. uh, rather than just taking a uh, uh, more casual relationship with the employee that you take a very aggressive one mm -hmm. because uh, many of these people have not been in the uh, marketplace uh, for many years, they've been here, they, they thought that they were going to finish uh, their careers in, in, with this government, and now uh, we've decided to go another route, and so we're dealing with people's futures. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just uh, ask you to be very aggressive in, the terms, in, in terms of finding employment so that the outreach services are more than filling out applications, showing them how to fill out applications, but being aggressive and, and trying to match them up with a job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah, just to follow up, many of my uh, staff people have handled outplacements in the past and from within the staff also, in, since some of them have had uh, extensive careers in the private sector occasionally, they've been the target of outplacement themselves. And so we have some special empathy that this is an arduous process, it is a painful process, and it's one that we are going to make every effort to make as easy as possible. Chair, would just observe uh, that the gentleman from Arizona's points are well taken had they been followed by the previous majority in hiring practices more frequently, we would have had a pool of talent that was probably different than the one we have now. Uh, and that I would also indicate to the gentleman that upwards of 200 of these individuals could find employment if uh, every member of his party would hire at least one. Uh, we could solve the problem uh, mostly right here within the uh, Hill family. Gentleman from Kansas. Mr. Chairman, we're working so that all 265 can be taken care of in that manner. Uh, 197. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can pick up all 265. <laughs> More than welcome that addition to the uh, Democrat member staff. Uh, gentleman from Kansas. Uh, I thank the chair. And I think he's made a very good point. I had not intended, this is one of those I had not intended to make a speech speech. However, however, uh, I don't think there's any member of Congress uh, who has uh, a better acquaintance in regards to the employees of the House, uh, say, than this member. Uh, that was not by personal choice to the extent of all the relationships, uh, uh, so much as it was uh, that the then minority leadership uh, sentenced me to be in charge of the Republican Patronage Committee. The uh, problem was that the committee was not in charge of anything and that we didn't have any patrons. Now we had a little bit, uh, and we tried our very uh, best effort uh, to uh, uh, certainly have the majority consider the appointment of people who had expertise and, uh, and the important skills. Uh, but the situation at that time was not downsizing, it was upsizing, uh, if anything, and it was based on the patronage system. I'm not trying to perjure it, that's just the way it was. And in regards to uh, any program uh, for counseling or economic assistance or to handle stress or to handle anything, well, there was none. Uh, what was happened in regards to personnel decisions, and I can speak from experience, uh, and again, I'm not trying to assess any kind of uh, 
a value judgment here uh, was that, uh, quite frankly, the personnel decisions were made out of the Speaker's <coughs> office and the Minority Leader's office with people appointed uh, to do that job. Uh, it then went to the Patronage Committee. Uh, it then went to the House Administration Committee. It then went to the House officers, or vice versa, it went from the Speaker's office to the House officers. Uh, aided and abetted and sometimes stopped and sometimes approved by various senior members uh, depending on the patronage of the individual and uh, quite frankly the impact of the senior member. There was no tenure. Uh, as a matter of fact it was based on seniority and politics and by politics I mean that in the finest sense of the word in terms of the fact that if you're a member or your patronage was not here any longer you were not here any longer unless you worked it out with some appropriate individual. So in terms of counseling and in terms of uh, stress and family and economic planning that we're trying to put into effect now and that I certainly agree with in terms of a, a professional manner, it was non-existent. As a matter of fact, there was a plank there and uh, when your uh, tenure was up in terms of your patronage, why, why the plank was no longer there. It was adios. Uh, now this can be very difficult. Now, these are real people. These are important jobs. They may be low-skill jobs. The thought occurs to me, if they're very low-skill jobs, well, we shouldn't have very low-skill jobs. Uh, we should have a little bit more important high-skill jobs with less people doing a better job in a cost-efficient way for the taxpayer and the House of Representatives. And that is not to point the finger at anybody, because we have many fine employees here who are very dedicated. So this is a first-step process to try to initiate this program with counseling, with compassion, and with feeling. First time we've ever done it. And so I uh, share the concern uh, in regards to compassion and how this is going to work with all of my colleagues on the committee, I, I commend the CAO for um, a very difficult uh, task and challenge as we try to meet this, and obviously those of us on this committee are going to have the oversight responsibility to make sure that it works well. But in comparison to what has been done in the past on both sides of the aisle, uh, let me tell you this is a market improvement. Uh, I'd like to move that the committee agree to the resolution, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion in front of us to agree to the resolution. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Maryland. If I might, just uh, I appreciate the gentleman's remarks. Uh, and I think that the gentleman from uh, his experience uh, and his participation is sensitive to the uh, concerns of employees. Uh, and he mentioned the patronage committee. I, I think it useful as we about to adopt this, and I'm going to offer an amendment, um, that we did have language adopted in the last Congress, which sought to address the problem addressed by uh, some of the reforms, uh, uh, at least on paper. Uh, we deleted, however, that provision uh, when the rules were changed in the 104th Congress. That provision said subject to the policy direction and oversight of the Committee on House Administration, the director, uh, which was selected, as we all know, by a joint process with the minority leader's participation. And in fact, if the minority leader didn't agree, the director could not be chosen. Uh, develop, the director shall develop employment standards that provide all employment decisions for functions under the director's supervision be made in accordance with non-discrimination provisions of Clause 9 of Rule 53 and Rule 51 without regard to political affiliation and solely on the basis of fitness to perform the duties involved. No adverse personnel action may be taken by the director without cause. Now, I, I mention that only because obviously that was a, a, an object of discussion in which Mr. Roberts and I and Mr. Faisal, Mr. Gadenson and uh, Mr. Thomas and others participated in trying to get to a system whereby we have professional employees uh, not patronage employees uh, who are selected, as it has been set forth, on the basis of their ability and experience to carry out an effective uh, personnel system for the people's house, uh, in which some of us are Democrats and some of us are Republicans. Uh, so I, I agree with the thrust of the gentleman's comments. I will have some additional comments a little later on, which gives me concern about the uh, repolitization of the personnel uh, system in the House of Representatives. But I will comment on that later, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would offer an amendment consistent with, well, I believe, what Ms. Carlson uh, said, Mr. Chairman, to the resolution that's been offered, if I might, which would uh, strike 
in, in the matter after the first resolving clause strikeout, quote, agreed to by, excuse me, agreed to by the committee on or after June 14th, 1995. The reason for striking that, that would imply that it is only future uh, employees that would be affected by this, and Ms. Carlson indicates that was not the intent. And insert, Mr. Chairman, in lieu thereof, uh, after, uh, on line five, it would read, and who are affected by reforms and or personal, personnel actions effective on or after January 4th, 1995. I, I think that's what Ms. Carlson uh, seemed to indicate was the intent, and I think if, if the chairman concludes it's a friendly amendment. We have language to that effect. Anyone needed in writing, ordinarily we would deal with uh, written amendments. This one, I think, is uh, relatively um, simple to understand and we'll obviously have uh, staff working together to make sure that we affect what we intend to do, and that is indicate that these uh, personnel opportunities uh, that are being provided in this resolution will be provided to those employees who were employees of the House when the new majority took over on or after January 4th. It was and I don't intended to apply to anyone who uh, left their job in the 103rd Congress, but it would extend to any individual who, through policy uh, changes or decisions by this committee, on or after January 4th. Is that the intent of yes, the Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think you stated well. And, and frankly, I don't have a specific individual in mind, although I right. do know a number of specific individuals who may want to avail themselves of the services that are being provided. And this is simply uh, a function of the fact that uh, as we've organized this and seen the need for it, clearly those people were affected by the same policies. They ought to be afforded the same opportunities. That is the intent of the gentleman's amendment. Any comment on the amendment? Uh, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the amendment then is incorporated on the resolution itself. Any additional comments? All those in favor of the resolution entitled employee assistance. Uh, I had indicated earlier that we're just going to go ahead and do a roll call uh, on every one of these, if that's so okay with everyone. So we'll, instead of asking for the roll, we'll just uh, assume that there will be a roll call on each of these resolutions, given uh, the importance of the change uh, of the votes in front of us. So the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Aye. Mr. Roberts? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will report to. There being eight members voting in the affirmative and one member voting in the negative, the motion is carried. A uh, resolution entitled Employee Assistance as Amended. Uh, is passed uh, by a vote of uh, eight to one, and the motion to recommit is laid on the table uh, Mr. without Chairman, objection. I have to staff be authorized to make technical and forming changes. Uh, without objection. Uh, the second uh, resolution to authorize issuance of an RFP, in house jargon, for office postal operations. Ms. Carlson? To summarize this resolution, what is an RFP for or those <laughs> folks who might be curious? It's a request for proposals. It's to ask outside firms to propose under certain contract terms to operate these functions within the House. Thank and you. <laughs> you're welcome. This resolution authorizes the preparation and issuance of an RFP oh. for the delivery operations of, of postal mail within the House of Representatives and that all of this would be done subject to the approval of the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member, that the request for proposals must specify utilization of House facilities and then current employees both of the postal operations and of the publications and distribution service shall be interviewed or given the opportunity to interview for positions. It would authorize the United States Postal Service to operate the current five window facilities that exist within the House complex and again would require the CAO to report to the committee monthly by the 10th of the month on his progress in carrying out this resolution. Mr. Faulkner. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn over the details on this one to Mr. Lusby, who is my Deputy Assistant Associate Administrator for Publications and Distribution. Ben, would you talk about the research? Thank you. We, uh, 
look at every possible alternative. Um, and we came down to three alternatives. One was to improve the current operations. Two was to improve the current operations and move the location. And three was to look at outsourcing postal operations. There's three problems with the current operation that kept recurring. One is the physical location of postal operations, where part of the operations are literally in the basement of Rayburn. Uh, secondly, is the higher than private industry salaries, as much when you consider benefits as $11,000. And third was, <coughs> excuse me, was the changing volumes of mail. Again, as was alluded to earlier, uh, there's peak mail and staff was constantly staffed to hire, to, to process all of the mail at the highest levels. So basically what we did was to start looking at, again, this flexibility of workload and trying to resolve this high level of fixed cost. And the alternatives that we are pursuing here are looking at the window operations being turned over to the U.S. Postal System. The, what this will do is actually improve service because not only will we be staffing the operation with the Postal Service, but also they have been experimenting over the last couple of years with 24-hour a day, seven day a week access using automated vending. And so what we are seeing is traditional window operations supplemented after normal work hours with automation. So given the erratic hours and intense hours of the Hill work environment, this will allow people to mail letters, mail packages at any time 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is a dramatic improvement over current activities. Well, I knew that once they invented machines that would give you money 24 hours a day, it wouldn't be long before people figured out ways to make sure you could spend it 24 yes. hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> the one obviously follows the other. Any questions or discussion uh, by members? Gentlemen from Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, did you review uh, major corporations in the country and how they distribute their in-house mail? I mean, do universities, do, you know, do they all... Do they all go out and hire outside firms to handle these things? A lot of them do. It's, it's a growing trend in and the private Can industry. you give me some examples of the ones that do? Um, there's various Blue Cross plans that do. Um, I, I can't think off the top of my head others. I know IBM, uh, mobile. Hire outside people to... Yes, facilities to, management. For and, do, and do they deliver mail? Um, Again, three, four times a day as we do on Saturdays. Absolutely. In fact, we met with the uh, Building Owners and Managers Association and the American Institute of Architects to solicit their ideas on uh, building management companies in New York, Philadelphia, D.C. area and how they take care of mail because in many ways we could look at ourselves as a horizontal version of the World Trade Center, numerous individual entities within a very large complex. And so you, if we're one corporation. We're one corporation. And, and, and if you took out the salary differential, uh, because our s workers have been here longer or what have you, or benefits, uh, is there a substantial savings in the alternative distribution methods? Just the distribution. Well, any savings is dependent on what the bid on the RFP comes in at. But if you compare, you know, similar situations, they distribute the, vo the, the per piece to, for a lot less money? There, there's projected over a million dollars savings. The projected savings, though, takes advantage of the differential in the expected salaries of the employees, does it not? So if we were to fire all our people and hire people who were off the street for less money, we could get that savings and operate our own mail system. Isn't that correct? But we couldn't operate it as well as a facilities management company. That's their business. Um, they can bring in state-of-the-art equipment. They can, we can carefully identify our, our requirements, and that's their job. 
So a company like that, a company like that has to pay about 20 percent tax on its revenue. Is that correct? Uh, we're not tax lawyers. We couldn't oh. tell you. Well, that's about what they pay. They pay about a 20 percent tax, and um, and so so you be it's you believe we'll be able to save all this money uh, and maintain the same quality of service and improve yes, it and improve it again I think the key to this and all the other proposals we're bringing out today is that a private vendor has the luxury of varying their costs to meet the needs of a varying work why can't we do that it is part of it is is that a a large vendor has numerous clients and can reallocate staff to to create a smooth workflow and consistent employment of that staff. We're only serving the members and staff of the House of Representatives. What does it cost us to distribute the mail at this point? About four million six hundred, about four million seven hundred thousand. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And. Um, and uh, it's your belief that there'll be a 20 percent savings, roughly? We believe that the new budget figure will be 3.5 million. And uh, that 1.2 million difference, how much of that is because they pay their people less per hour? It would depend on the, uh, the, the vendor who is ultimately selected. Again, it isn't necessarily the per hourly rate as much as an individual who may be f employed full time but is not working full time. And again, many companies have flex time employees, have part time employees. And but if you've looked at other contracts, I mean, what happens is the vendor comes in and starts off with minimum wage employees, essentially. Not necessarily. Many vendors in both in this service area and the other service areas that we are pursuing today will actually bring in high-level people, especially in the initial stages, because they want to establish the customer loyalty. You know, I get very nervous in this uh, process because, one, obviously, when these people get unemployed, if they're the ones that are laid off, the government pays the unemployment. Maybe it's not this branch of government's budget that it comes out of, but it's a cost to the Treasury, and we're all working for the people of the country. In my district, uh, in the early 80s, there was a great uh, desire to contract out all kinds of things. We got rid of the Marines at military bases, and we put in, you know, uh, private security guards. And some of the bids were so low that in the same year of the bid, guess what happened? The bidders went out of business, and we got stuck for, reinst you know, for paying off their employees and bringing in new companies, and the service was worse. And, um, you know, I am fearful that in this whole process, uh, rather than uh, as in the old days, that maybe the key personnel that worked for a committee chairman changed when a chairman uh, changed, that what we're about to do is lay off, essentially, a large number of people who've, who know this institution, who know the difference between Gunderson and Gadenson and get the mail to me in a timely manner. I do occasionally get Mr. Gunderson's mail, as he occasionally gets mine, but I think, you know, these people have been around for a long time. They know if uh, Mr. Thomas ought to get the mail at his office or his committee or, or any of the leaders or the Speaker of the House, where they ought to get it. And um, there are people out there in crises who write to us and expect us to respond. The volume in of itself is a real challenge uh, for the, you know, personal staff. and. Uh, I haven't seen the savings. I've seen savings in the first year, and then by the second and third year where you don't have an internal uh, group of people to compete with, the vendor says, well, the costs have gone up, the equipment costs me more, my tax bill is higher, and all of a sudden you don't have control and you don't have, uh, you don't have the savings. I know uh, in my, the only business I run outside this committee at the moment is my campaign. And when I print stuff in-house, I own my own printing equipment in the campaign, I save a fortune. And every time I have to go to an outside printer, it costs me multiples of what it costs me to do it uh, myself. Now, if you're not up to the job of managing our employees, then maybe we should have gotten somebody else to do it. But I am, 
you know, this is a very trendy thing to contract out all these services, but we are hamstringing members' ability to represent their constituents and respond to their constituents in a number of way, this, ways. This is an institution that is the model for the world for democracy. For all the complaints that I hear on the other side about how terrible this system was, there, every country in the world looks to the United States as a model of representative government. And what I've seen in recent years is a continued assault on the ability of an individual member to represent his constituents do it in a timely and effective manner. And I don't believe the model for the legislature ought to be to take loyal employees who've done their job and throw them out of the streets so somebody can come in on a short-term basis, give us a one-year savings, and then we are hostage. We no longer have equipment. We no longer have our own trained employees who provided the service. And so I'm very skeptical of these uh, proposals. I can draft you a proposal where I can save probably even more money you know, if you figure you're going to come in with, uh, with, with lower paid personnel and uh, the cost of the Treasury will be greater in the long term. It will be greater unless you degrade services. It will be greater unless you de destroy people's salary base by giving them such low salaries that they can't survive. And then I guess we'll sit back and complain why people are on public assistance when we've created all these jobs in this country that are such a low wage that people can't take care of their families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, we'll have no demonstration. The chair will recognize the former ranking member of the Post Office Task Force, the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Roberts. Well, I appreciate um, uh, the remarks of the gentleman from Connecticut, and I share his concern in regards to the uh, to the obvious, um, unique uh, responsibilities of the House Post Office to somehow manage the ebb and flow of the mail that comes to the Congress. We rely on that. It is our, our bread and butter. Uh, the decision in regards to the mail flow uh, usually was not made by the Postmaster or the House Administration Committee, but by various interest groups who um, or aggrieved or uh, or other parties who uh, uh, were partners in government, i.e. the American Association of Retired Persons who would uh, send an alert out and all of a sudden the Congress would be deluged by mail. Uh, th I'm not trying to say that's in error, but uh, it became very difficult, always has been very difficult uh, for those in charge of the post office to try to determine that, and it is a real problem. I can remember in regards to the Police and Personnel Committee uh, we had the responsibility to try to hire the employees to handle the mail. All of a sudden, members were indicating that we were a week behind or 10 days behind, and a tremendous influx of mail would come in. And so the management of that is very difficult, and our employees tried as best they could to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to answer those responsibilities. The postmaster would come in before the subcommittee and indicate, I need 30 new employees as of yesterday, and they, hired, and, and, and they had to hire them part-time. And so, in, and so in terms of expertise and experience, there was none except just to handle the mail, just in terms of bodies to get it out. Uh, it seems to me that that is not the approach that we want to take. And with all due respect to the comments made by the gentleman of Connecticut, I do not think that the, uh, uh, that the best symbol of the world in regards to American democracy is the House Post Office. In regards to what has happened, uh, that's a past chapter. I hope this is the last chapter of... Uh, a very difficult experience. Uh, there's no need to recount uh, uh, the unpleasantness uh, uh, in regards of, uh, of that whole investigation. Uh, I, I think this is probably a fallout uh, of those problems uh, as we try to best to determine how to manage uh, the flow of the mail to the House, whether it is by mail or whether it is by fax or whether it is by telephone or whatever. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions in regards to the ebb and flow. I might add that we've gone through this before, and, uh, and the structure of the basic uh, services remain the same. I would use the house restaurant. Uh, that may not be comparable, may not be a good analogy, but uh, we have had the house manage the house restaurant. We had Service America contract out. We had the house come, in, come back in and manage the restaurant, and now we have Marriott. So, you know, these things go Gentlemen, back and forth. 
Uh, not until I'm finished with my statement, I'll be more than happy to yield. Uh, and so consequently, as we go through these things, there are problems and there are challenges. But I, I would like to ask the CEO if I could, first, the relationship in regards to the U.S. Postal Service uh, with whoever would be bid appropriate uh, in regards to contracting out. Uh, we found uh, that in the transition from a patronage run uh, house post office and then the problems uh, that ensued, that the U.S. Postal Service was very helpful in regards to uh, providing some quality guidance and some expertise. Is it your plan to be in concert with the U.S. Uh, Postal Service so there will be a smooth transition? Uh, and if you would just respond to that, please. Definitely on this and any other service change that we are planning to make, the continuity of service to members is our utmost importance. And we, as I said earlier about the bus going 90 miles an hour, we cannot let that bus go off the road and fall into the ditch. And we are looking in each one of these cases at no disruption. But I'll let uh, Ben talk about some of the details on the numbers because we've tracked the ebb and flow of our volume. Well, the, the volume can, can change as much as 25% from one month to another. And it, it, or one week to another. Well, actually, yes, literally. And, and it's a constant problem with staffing. And again, we, we staff to what we anticipate, but it's very, very difficult to project how much mail is going to come in the door. And in your opinion, and in regard to the concern of the gentleman from Connecticut, and I think every member of the committee, we must handle that ebb and flow. Uh, I, I can, and, and with all due respect to the contracting out, uh, we have been through this, as I've indicated, with the restaurant and in other areas, and we're about to uh, embark uh, on some bold plans. My opening statement indicated that it's the work product that's going to be the final line here, whether or not we can serve members, staff, and our constituents, i.e. the taxpayer. And the thing that concerns me is that I don't think too many uh, firms that would try to bid, and it's always a very natural inclination for any firm to say, gee, I'd like to serve the House of Representatives. That would really really be a feather in my cap. And then they come in and they find the ebb and flow of the situation, and in terms of profit and loss, it's very, very difficult, extremely difficult. As in the restaurant's case, you can have a very, very busy time, an overload time, two or three days a week, and all of a sudden you have nobody. And, in, and so in terms of August, when we have the break, when the mail comes down, all of a sudden some interest group says, oh my gosh, uh, you, know, we're, you, know, uh, you know, we're very concerned about this. And the legislative business of this House in this session is unbelievable, as you know. And so our concern, I think, is can this uh, contracting out really serve the members and our constituents? I think the uh, you key know, do they have that expertise, do you think, in regards to that effort? The industry. Yes, they do have that expertise. They, we can, they can call in people from other sites. They can, uh, they can even call in equipment. I've seen situations where additional equipment has been brought in. So they have more flexibility than we do, and, and we are specifically building into the RFP the requirements that this contractor has to meet. It's very detailed. It's, it's not so detailed as to tie their hands. We want them to be aggressive and have ideas and lead to a world-class operation. But we have requirements built in there that are very specific, and they must be met. Once again, in looking at the uh, track record of outsourcing from public sector to private sector, whether you look at Arlington County across the river, whether you look at places like the University of Wisconsin or the state of Minnesota, or even our counterparts in the New Zealand legislature, the key is a clearly worded statement of work as part of the RFP and providing detailed information on the nature of the work to the potential vendor and ultimately setting up clear documentable, quantifiable performance standards to hold that vendor to. Where those three criteria are met, savings are met, are, are achieved on an ongoing basis and services maintained. Where those three things are somehow lacking, there are problems. And you go town by town, county by county, state government by state government, and even legislature or parliament by parliament. That track record seems to hold up over the last 10 years as this privatization has 
become in vogue. I apologize to the gentleman for Connecticut for going on, and I will yield to the gentleman. There's just one other comment I want to make in keeping with our concern. You know, in, in rural and small town America, we have, uh, we have RFD. And Ben Franklin thought that everybody in the country ought to receive the same kind of mail service whether they live in Washington or in Dodge City, Kansas. And the thing that concerns me is that we have people who would like to move it to USPS and privatize the Postal Service, which means we'd have a stamp machine and a letter every other Thursday out in, uh, say, rural America. And that's because of the ebb and flow in the numbers. And in terms of contracting out, most people depend on numbers to make a profit in order to, in order to make things work. And that's the concern I have because the mail has to be delivered on time uh, in, this, uh, in this Congress. I, uh, as I can say, we would be sitting there trying to determine whether we need 50 part-time employees and somebody would say, how much does it cost? And the speaker and the minority leader and everybody else concerned said, damn it, get the mail out. Or no, number one, get the mail in so then we can inter delay and all hell would break loose. And so when all hell breaks loose, I hope we have the flexibility to step up to this issue. I yield to the gentleman from Connecticut. What time the gentleman has remaining, he I just say that I agree with the gentleman's concerns and uh, thought that uh, he expressed them well, particularly that when you look at our job here providing service to our constituents, that a constituent who, who is in crisis, uh, you may not be able to repair the damage of a constituent's letter who got here too late uh, to help them in the midst of that crisis. Gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also have the same concerns that uh, Mr. Robert has. Uh, I was in county government for many years, and I have to tell you that at one time we looked at privatization not only of the mail, but also the mm -hmm. computers and uh, the whole information system. And it became <laughs> more expensive in trying to correct that uh, situation. We did contract out, then we found ourselves that the, uh, the mail and the computer services were not what we had expected, even though we're saving money, that there were so many complaints we had to revert back to an in-house, and we found ourselves, any savings we had, it became more expensive to go back and, and recoup the system that was more manageable and more effective. I have to tell you my experience here on the ebb of mail, the highs and lows, is, is uh, I've never experienced it before, and I think this is one of the few institutions that has such a big volume of mail, and it comes at particular points, and it goes, uh, goes down particular points, like uh, the restaurant uh, example that Mr. Roberts gave. That, uh, I, I, it's my belief that you're going to have a very difficult time finding a vendor who's had anywhere the experience that would be needed, the expertise, and maybe even the flexibility to be able to handle uh, such a job. I know that you talked about uh, Arlington County, but I have to tell you that Arlington County, a great county government as it is, is not the capital of the United States in terms of the uh, flow of mail that we have. And to say that we're going to reduce uh, the number of employees. We're going to save $1.2 million because we're paying less services. Uh, the equipment that may, be, that may be brought in by the vendor may not be any more effective because of the type of mail that we get in this place. Uh, and and, I, and I, I, I still have doubt that you're going to have, uh, you're going to have a lot of vendors uh, respond very articulately to a RFP that you're going to put out because they're going to do it. They're going to respond to the RFP point by point. And, uh, but in implementing an, an RFP, especially if they've never had this experience before, can be very uh, non-profitable to them, unprofitable to them. And then we may find ourselves, as Mr. Uh, Gadenson has said, that we find ourselves hostage uh, What with poor service and not able to meet the demands of our members and have to go back into a system of how, how do you assure that the vendor in fact is going to be is going to be qualified uh, beyond the response to the RFP and that we have uh, uh, a way to, to uh, ensure that this world-class uh, service is going to rely more on less uh, salaries and and inexperienced employees in, in many cases. Uh, thank you for your, your concerns. The, 
As we have looked at all of the services provided within the CAO operation to the House of Representatives, this is the only one that we're coming to the committee with, with a, with a proposal to do an RFP. The reason is, is that we have looked, whether it's the photography studio, the folding room, other areas, the uh, gift shops, and assessed the potential savings, assessed the potential vendor marketplace, and assessed those very issues. And where the numbers and the market governs a recommendation of a private sector vendor, we've come forward to the committee with that, which is this one. In the case of all the other uh, activities, we have not found that same cost differential and that same comfort level in the marketplace, which is why we're not proposing those others to be privatized as fully as this one. The, uh, again, we're, we're, we came into the assessment process with no preordained result. We are not privatizing for privatizing sake. We're looking at every option. Again, the resolution is high fixed costs, high variable workflow. And we feel that the research we've done in this area in particular justifies this, this recommendation. Well, I have, to tell, I have to tell you that the, the beauty shop, the barber shop, the restaurants, the uh, photography, the uh, radio and TV studio have a very little impact in my political life here. Mm -hmm. The mail, mail is a high priority. And all so, of us. Well, it, it is. Uh, so you can, you know, uh, so how do you assure a comfort level for a person who has to rely on the mail coming in at the peak times and at the low times so I can respond as quickly and get it out as quickly as I can? How can you assure me that the vendors who I don't have the same assurance or I don't have the same feeling of comfort that you're going to find a vendor because this place is so unique, this place is so different that there is not a vendor, whether it be in this country or New Zealand, that has the expertise, the experience, and probably doesn't have the flexibility to be able to handle the mail situation in this house. The proposal before us today is really the beginning of the process of investigating outsourcing and the beginning of the process with this committee on this issue. After today, if this proposal is approved, we come back to the committee with the request for proposal in draft form, and that is then approved by the committee as well. At the other end of the picture, after the RFP has gone out, and we've gone to best and final, we come back to the committee because of the size of the procurement for its approval of that vendor. If the committee does not have a comfort level with that vendor, we will continue to pursue. If we do not find a vendor, we will then go back and look at doing this in-house. I mean, we are not going to say if, the, if a vendor doesn't rise to the occasion that we're going to outsource no matter what. It has to meet certain criteria and that criteria, if, if the committee is comfortable with it, we will pursue it. If, they're not, if you're not comfortable with it, we will uh, continue to look at options in source. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few comments in response to uh, the issues raised by the gentleman from Connecticut. First of all, I hope if any of his constituents are in a crisis, they don't write to him here. Uh, the, the major delay is, of course, getting the letters through the post office in the, uh, in the district. And I'm astounded at the slow delivery. I, I don't think there's any problem with the delivery within the House, but certainly there's a problem in getting the letters here in the first place. But I, on the general question of whether or not... Uh, yes. The gentleman I know will be happy to uh, uh, know that the quarterly report on the Postal Service uh, for the first time has the District of Columbia and the Washington metropolitan area over 80 percent in on-time first-class mail delivery. Je the gentleman makes a good point. We've been working on it. It's improving. I, thank, I, I thank the gentleman for the comments. I appreciate that, and I've been watching that with interest. I was astounded when I first got here and, and realized uh, how long it took mail to get here. The, uh, on the main issue, however, uh, 
I, along with Mr. Pastor, have experience in local and state government where uh, outsourcing has become quite common. And I agree with uh, a number of his reservations. In my experience, generally, you're better off doing things in-house um, if you have a constant workload. However, this is a classic case, both the post office, the folding room, and the printing. It's a classic case where the workload is not constant. And if you do it in-house, you have to provide a staff and facilities that are able to deal with a tremendously varying workload. The advantage of going with a private vendor is that they uh, can be large enough to average out the fluctuations of the number of different people that they serve. An example uh, in the mail delivery would be over the Christmas period when our mail drops down to almost nothing. But for most organizations, the, the mail load goes up because of delivery of Christmas, uh, Christmas mail of one sort or another. And so the advantage of outsourcing is to average that out and get better service to everyone at lower cost. A prime example of fluctuation is this handy dandy little chart which is in everyone's desk. It deals with the mail going out rather than the mail coming in. But again, the principle is true. Uh, the actual, this reflects cost per thousand but actually the number of pieces mailed is the inverse of that. And you can see from that the tremendous variation in the small amount of mail that goes out of this place in the fall months and uh, until the first of the year. So I think the real argument for outsourcing here is the fluctuation, the variability of the amount of work that has to be done and the fact that if you have a fixed staff as we do, uh, there are periods of the year where they really don't have enough to do. Other times they're totally overwhelmed and with the new laws requiring, since we now subject ourselves to the laws everyone else has to obey, that means we're going to be paying a lot of overtime for the heavy periods, and uh, we're going to have people sitting on their hands during the light periods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other member wish to uh, inquire? Hey, may I ask a question? Gentleman from Louisiana. Has there been consideration given to a bifurcation of this approach? where a part of this problem can be addressed by uh, having the post office take over supervision of certain windows and, and having the, uh, um, the, the staff of the house continue with the uh, mail uh, uh, delivery service that we're talking about here. We considered that and wanted to take the first option as looking at the, the outsourcing. Again, if we do not find a vendor that the committee is comfortable with, we will then look at the in-source options. But from the standpoint of what we feel is the marketplace and what we feel is the potential savings, the analysis leads us to looking at outsourcing as the first and preferable option. Will the gentleman yield? But also, your plan includes the takeover by the, the U.S. Postal Service of the five windows, which they currently right. offer at no expense to us option, at their the, own expense. the windows go to the post office. Yes, that, that I understand to be the case. It was, the, the issue was whether they could be dealt with not uh, as uh, items one and two in the same resolution, but whether you could go along with the, with the post office, take over the windows, but not the other part of it. Uh, and whether there would be some, something accomplished that would be uh, convenient and uh, uh, efficient for the, uh, for the operation, uh, but at the same time would not uh, take, would take into account the concerns that are being raised around about the expertise that the uh, employees now have in making the, the various deliveries. Uh, I think it's something to be, to be considered. There is a, a price we pay here for what we say is a cost savings. And uh, at the bottom, you have to always remember that it's important to get this service done. And it may not be, uh, it may be penny wise uh, in, on this question, uh, the way we're proceeding here, because, and I understand this business about fluctuations and, and, and all that <coughs> sort of thing. Um, but uh, the, the it is a matter of uh, how well the job gets done, and you have to prioritize the areas which are most critical. As, as uh, Mr. Pastor says, uh, if you go down, you have to kind of deal with these things in tandem. Uh, the, the, this, the, the expertise may be more valuable in one or another area than uh, in this area, let's just say, than in another. 
and, and therefore the tolerance or the cost of getting it done may, may, it, it, it may be more reasonable uh, to have it here than in some other place. And so it isn't um, an open and shut door on this, and I really think it ought to be further considered, and it ought not be uh, offered in uh, tandem like this. We ought to separate it out if we can. I think everyone could agree about the post office part of it. The other part of it troubles me, so. Gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to comment on the uh, remarks of uh, Mr. Roberts. He and I agree on a lot of these things, I think. But I would like to observe, uh, in following also on the gentleman from Connecticut, with reference to the operation of the post office. Uh, we had substantial problems uh, with the post office. Nobody doubts that. Um, uh, the public knows that. We, we know it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, however, again, uh, we professionalized the post office. Uh, we brought in uh, one of uh, a high-level employee of the United States Postal Service, which you want to continue to operate, Mr. Cheney. Uh, Mr. Michael uh, and Mr. Foley both agreed that Mr. Cheney did an excellent job. Uh, I was want to tell you, frankly, Mr. Chairman, very concerned that uh, not for cause, but for whatever reasons, uh, Mr. Cheney was removed. Uh, he was selected jointly by the Speaker and the minority leader. So this was not a partisan appointment. He was not involved in any way previously in any political uh, endeavor. Uh, I think that, frankly, was a mistake. Uh, I've told Mr. Faulkner I believe that was a mistake in, in, in private discussions, so this doesn't come as a surprise to him. But we were on the right road. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'm going to offer an amendment uh, to this uh, resolution. I want to uh, say that I agree with the comments, Mr. Chairman, made by the gentleman from Louisiana. Uh, there really are two issues uh, raised here, and it may be well to consider them uh, separately, individually. I understand what Mr. Faulkner is saying. But uh, I don't think anybody disagrees that the United States Postal Service ought to continue, particularly at, at when it is no cost to us, operating the five windows they now operate. That makes sense. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a continuum of service uh, and a good service. The issue is, uh, do we outsource the uh, internal delivery of mail once received at our docks? Uh, and uh, as I understand the resolution, that is still a decision yet to be made. Am I correct on that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, and I would tell the gentleman that uh, he uh, inadvertently misspoke. Uh, the windows are not currently operated by the United States Post Office. We run our own windows. Part of the resolution is to propose Excuse me. that with the new post office, frankly, the chairman opposed allowing the United States Postal Service, the old Postal Service, to come into the House. The new Postal Service, I believe, is a a different animal, and that's part of the uh, resolution. We currently do everything internally, uh, uh, and uh, we're talking about in this resolution having the United States Post Office come in to run the windows with their personnel, and then uh, the uh, request for proposal from vendors to simply deal with the in-house delivery. Of point well taken. Uh, however, the, the point that the gentleman from uh, uh, Louisiana made is still uh, the valid point, I think, and that uh, I would certainly concur if the chairman believed that that was appropriate that we do that. Uh, but at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I will have an amendment to the resolution uh, as it now stands. Uh, at this point, I think it's appropriate that the chair test what he believes to be the tentative agreement uh, uh, between uh, the chair and the, and the ranking member since there is a proposed amendment to this particular resolution at the appropriate time. It's the chair's understanding that there will be no objection if the chair indicates uh, it probably would be um, more beneficial for all of our schedules trying to meet all of our commitments if we uh, hold all of the votes, both amendments to and on the resolutions, until the end of the discussion of all the resolutions. There is, any, is there any objection? The chairman would yield. Uh, the ranking member has uh, left the, but he informed me that that was the agreement between the ranking member and yourself, and uh, we would have no, uh, uh, on, on our side, I think. Uh, then at the appropriate time, we will entertain whatever amendments are offered, make sure we understand them, but then carry those along with the resolutions over uh, until we discuss all of the resolutions. Can we do it now? Uh, if there's no further discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I just ask the gentleman from Maryland 
uh, the nature of his amendment, so we might have a Well, we're, no, we're going to get to that. I just want to, on the general resolution in oh, okay. front of us. All right. All right. Uh, I, I would only say then that uh, the chair has been very tolerant of a degree of revisionist history uh, dealing with uh, the post office and the postmaster and the practices that were carried out. Uh, this gentleman was part of the task force on the post office. And uh, it, frankly, is less a reflection on the employees who were doing the job than it was on the supervision. Uh, and, uh, if necessary, I will return to the world of yesteryear, the plantation mentality under patronage, because these employees oftentimes, over their objection, would be told that they had to go down to someone's post office box, a member's post office box, at another post office and collect for them mail or documents or campaign checks or whatever else was involved. There were a whole host of requirements asked of these employees, driving people from one place to another, services that were far beyond the, the mail delivery aspect. And so when we examine the brief period of change in which we were trying to put these policies into place, one of the ironies uh, of discovering that when you took all those people and assigned them only the function for which we thought they were performing, there were times when clearly there were more employees than necessary given the downtime schedule uh, of the House. I am very sensitive to all of the comments that have been made. I'll repeat, I was probably the last one willing to turn our window operation over to the post office. Uh, I, more than once I've had a door locked on me before 5 o'clock, which was the posted hour on the post office in various neighborhood post offices. As I said, that was the old post office. The new post office, in terms of its outreach and its willingness to be far more flexible on its hours and creative in the way in which they offer services to people, I think clearly has uh, earned the right uh, to, to operate the windows. I don't think that's uh, under discussion as uh, a portion of the resolution. So at this time, perhaps, uh, the gentleman from Maryland or the gentleman uh, from Louisiana, if they have an understanding of their amendment, would it be to just divide the question at the appropriate time? Uh, or would it be more substantive and therefore we probably would like to see it in writing? I have a more substantive amendment, I think, Mr. Chairman. What we can also do then is uh, offer these in writing. We'll get them uh, reproduced so members can look at them prior to voting on them uh, at the end of the process uh, rather than the continuing to vote conceptually. Do you want me to explain the amendment now, Mr. Chairman? Uh, if you just briefly go over the amendment and then we'll... Mr. Chairman, this is a, a substantive amendment and uh, I hope is going to be acceptable uh, to the majority uh, party. Uh, I referenced earlier the... Uh, configuration at the request of the then minority uh, the majority agreed to in uh, the old rule 6 1a the re dealing with the director of non-legislative services but I think it's applicable here wherein that rule said at page 346 the director of non-legislative and financial services Mr. Faulkner's predecessor essentially uh, shall be appointed for a Congress by the speaker the majority leader and the minority leader acting jointly now, what that language meant was that the speaker and majority leader could not appoint without the concurrence and agreement of the minority leader. That is to say, the minority leader, in effect, had a veto over uh, that selection. Very frankly, uh, I'm not, uh, I was not one of those that uh, disagreed with the present procedure in the 104th Congress. That is, that the speaker uh, is in charge, in effect. However, having said that, uh, there are services in the House of Representatives, Mr. Chairman, that are uniquely uh, available to us all and must serve us all well, and that the good operation and honest operation of which will redound to the benefit of all of us. I was appalled by uh, what happened in the post office uh, and some other things that happened. Uh, uh, all of us, hopefully, were appalled by what happened in the bank. Having said that, I think it would be appropriate in a new open era to have a conjunctive rather than consultive uh, arrangement 
on changes of this type. I think they strengthen the changes. This is not done for partisan reason. It is done because I think, Mr. Thomas, we are uniquely, I think, advantaged in this committee because Mr. Thomas and Mr. Fazio work well together, respect one another, consult with one another well. What the amendment essentially does is in uh, uh, the resolving clauses provides for joint decisions to be made by Mr. Thomas and the ranking member as it relates to making this change. Uh, what that does is, I think, posit this change not in a partisan fashion but in a, a cooperative joint fashion and I frankly think it will strengthen it uh, in terms of a proposal. And it is the same precedent that we adopted in the 103rd Congress in dealing with uh, the Director of Non-Legislative Services. Obviously, this is a sensitive subject. The RFP will have to see, analyze it, Mr. Chairman. I know you'll do that. The staff will do that. Does it save us money? Does it provide for services uh, in peaks uh, as well as in valleys? Clearly, serving the valleys is not a problem, but the peaks are a problem. Uh, it's a problem, as Mr. Roberts pointed out, in terms of how do you maintain a workforce uh, for that long uh, period of time. Uh, Mr. Ellis points out, obviously, this, this does show that uh, in valley times, you go up when you amortize your costs uh, over fewer pieces of mail. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, want, I, I hope that the chairman nor the committee believes this is a, uh, uh, an adverse uh, uh, or, or in any way uh, hostile uh, amendment or an implication other than there is good consultation which I know the ranking member is not here appreciates, but he has informed the rest of us that he has good consultation with him. And I would hope that the, uh, uh, the majority party uh, and the chairman would see this as an effort, uh, as, as a way to providing a broader basis for these very tough decisions. They're going to have very tough ramifications for some people if we contract out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would tell the gentleman, obviously, we'll uh, vote on the amendment uh, at the previously agreed upon time, but I understand the sum and substance of his amendment. In fact, it's contained in virtually every resolution, uh, and that uh, certainly we don't view it as hostile, uh, but it certainly is unacceptable. Uh, and I will not uh, go into a long history of this gentleman's involvement on the House uh, Administration Oversight Subcommittee and an attempt to make the old system that the gentleman described work. Frankly, uh, the former majority had no interest in sharing power in any way. It was forced to that position by the absolute collapse of the system uh, of selecting officers out of a party caucus and keeping them in office through a patronage system of members to the officer. It collapsed with the House Bank and the Sergeant of Arms. It collapsed with the Postmaster and the uh, obvious criminal activity now admitted to uh, by the former Postmaster. It was only after those incidents was there uh, a, 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 a even a willingness to discuss a plan uh, which was offered in large part by this gentleman and perfected in large part by this gentleman, arguing that it was an institutional problem to share responsibilities. Uh, the former majority set up a rule structure which in fact uh, made a mockery of a shared responsibility. It set up an oversight committee which if in fact there was no agreement, it went to the full committee which was clearly structured on a partisan basis and a decision of the full committee on a partisan basis then determined what occurred. There was no sharing. There was the appearance of equality in the selection of the director. Gentlemen might recall that the first and only director of this new institution resigned, absolutely frustrated with the partisan string pulling that had occurred. We only then had an acting director in that position. There was a failure and an unwillingness to go to the selection of a new director. Let me repeat that. The first director quit in disgust over the failure to deliver product in the way that he thought the system was supposed to work. The partisan controls remained in place. The acting director was all we had after that. That was not with the approval of the majority and minority uh, uh, position under the legislation. That was simply someone who occupied the position. I will tell you that I fully understand your concern about being a part of the process. I was in that position for many years. 
Uh, what the speaker and the leadership of the new majority has indicated is, as I said at the beginning, we are absolutely serious about accountability, responsibility, and accessibility. And to that I added transparency. We are going to be getting an audit. We are going to have an open system. And that I believe fundamentally it's less important who's involved in terms of the line-making decision structure than it is that it's an open decision-making process so that you're accountable and we know who made the decisions and we have an outside audit to undergird everything that we do so that when something goes wrong, you don't try to cover it up for months or even years, as was done previously, but it's out there for everyone to see so that we can correct it. In this new environment, which is fundamentally different than the old environment, I believe a clear line of responsibility is important to making the process work. So that you can't argue, well, gee, we had to share the responsibility and it wasn't what I really wanted to do. We have given Newt the ball, and we have given the Republican leadership the ball, and if they fumble it, we know who's responsible. I keep saying they, I think it's we, uh, uh, and I share in that. Uh, if we fumble the ball, it will be out there plain for everyone to see. If the people that we've put in charge fumble the ball, it will be plain. It's out there for everybody to see. If we try to cover it up, an independent audit coming right behind us will expose it. It is an entirely different world than that old partisan world that tried to put a patch of fairness on top of it. So I understand the gentleman's concern, and I will be most concerned when the ranking member complains to an open microphone that I am shutting him out, I am bypassing him, I am ramming things through without consultation, and in fact, a working cooperative structure. It has been my commitment to do that because I wore those other shoes for a long, long time. It will be open, but it will be consulted. Mr. Chairman, having worn those shoes, it appears to me that your perspective perhaps has now changed. Because the argument I'm making, you made, uh, uh, and I heard you make the argument. Uh, I thought it was a uh, good argument from time to time uh, on some issues, as you know, with respect to, uh, for instance, house coverage. As you know, I joined you, which uh, somewhat to the consternation, I think, probably of the leadership of the old committee, uh, when I thought uh, you were right, uh, as I thought Mr. Shays and Mr. Sweat were right on the uh, uh, sub subjecting us to the laws of uh, uh, that we subject others to. Um, all I can say is you made the argument I'm now making, and uh, uh, my point is if it was good then, it's good now. I will say the argument was made in a closed house, uh, a house in which uh, behind closed doors partisan decisions were made, carried out by partisans, elected by partisans, responsible to the partisans. Mr. Chairman. It is a different world in this Congress. Mr. Chairman. It is different fundamentally. Let me show you. That's why I'm not saying that the argument is analogous. I understand that. Let me show you an interesting chart. Let me show you an interesting chart. Uh, now, I can be as partisan as the next person, and for the most part, don't deal as partisan a fashion as some people around here deal with. And we're talking about nonpartisanship. The green dots reflect. RNC and RCC employment. The red dots are either the Reagan or the Bush administration. I've never worked for the RNC. The Nexus, you weren't with the campaign committee? Never. You never? Never drew, draw, drew a paycheck from the RNC or the RNCC. You were never with the Reagan campaign? That was not RNC okay. endeavor. Excuse me, the Reagan campaign, the RNC, and the RCCC. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. This is no allegation of wrongdoing. But very frankly, on our side, uh, we believe there's great partisanship on your side. Mr. Chairman, that's understandable. We're in a partisan business. But I'm not enamored, very frankly, with these were all uh, decisions based upon uh, professional expertise and past experience. Uh, I could go into each one of the resumes, which I have, as Mr. Faulkner has provided me with, as in this open, transparent house. But very frankly, when we see this as the background of seven out of the nine of the highest uh, ranking people, 
have uh, uh, one thing in common, and that is, uh, and Mr. Lusby is not one of those, by the way, uh, political involvement. Uh, I, I, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked at all. But I will tell Mr. Roberts what I am. I am uh, not enamored with hearing about nonpartisanship, transparency, uh, qualifications only uh, in terms of appointment. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. It doesn't shock me. I expected to find this uh, material. But it does not uh, uh, comport with what I think is the continued assertion that I hear all the time about the fact that this is totally non-political, this is above board, uh, this has nothing to do with politics, with just good management. Uh, you know, uh, I can go through every one of the resumes. Now, Ms. Ford, uh, I'm not going to go through your resume, but, uh, uh, and others, uh, you, you do have some things in common, and that is your activist Republican advocates. That's fine. But uh, I don't think that this came to being simply by going out into the uh, uh, workforce and searching for the most competent, capable, qualified people and personnel directors that we could find in the, uh, uh, in the environment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I didn't mean to go into that, but uh, you continue to uh, want to respond about how bad things were. I think things were bad. I think we didn't do things right. I was uh, disappointed with it. You saw that as I served on the committee with you. And I, in private, uh, and in public uh, said that. And I'm glad we're going to do things right. <coughs> but uh, I don't want to uh, be in a position where uh, doing things right under the 103rd Congress is no longer the way to do things under the 104th Congress because we have a totally nonpartisan environment. That's not true. Of course it's not true. And the gentleman uh, <laughs> took uh, the chairman's statements and took them in the direction that he wanted to go. Let me tell you why it's fundamentally different. In the task force, in an attempt to get to the bottom of the problems with the post office, the person who ran that was the postmaster. Postmaster was given his position by a partisan vote of the majority caucus and retained his position through favors that he gave to members. That's clearly now part of the record. Mr. Chairman, That's we how agree he retained. I, I won't yield my time right now. We agree on that. That's how he retained his position. We tried to get to the bottom of it. The postmaster lied to us. He had the comfort and the belief that by stonewalling it, his protectors would continue to protect him. What's the difference? In the 104th Congress, the Inspector General, a position that was created uh, a short time ago, previous to this Congress, and was given the munificent number of two employees to investigate all of these activities, now has 18 employees. He has the ability to do the job that someone said he was supposed to do in the first place. We have gone outside this institution to Price Waterhouse to get an independent outside audit. Had either of those things been in operation when the postmaster lied to members of Congress, we would have had an alternative source. It would have been transparent. It would have been accountable. We could have held him responsible. We had access to the information. None of those were available to us. And so the gentleman simply lied, believing that what he had done in the past would see him through the current situation. Unfortunately, the Department of Justice uh, had uh, other designs on the behavior of members and officers of this House. That is the difference. The fundamental difference regardless of the professional activities of these people attempting to shape them in a partisan sense, is not the way in which I used partisan. Obviously, Democrats employ Democrats, Republicans employ Demo uh, Republicans, and they can both be professional in carrying out their job. It was the institutional relationships on a partisan basis that brought us to the problems that we had in previous Congresses. Yes, we were beginning to correct them. In the 103rd, there were modest steps in that direction. People were getting more comfortable with the idea of actually allowing some sunshine in. What's occurred in the 104th from day one is total sunshine. 
And we're seeing that with the direction that we're going here in terms of the response from the chief administrative officer to the question about how you deal uh, with whether the post office is going to work or not. We're going to try. We're going to see if the RFP works. We're going to see if vendors, we're not reinventing the wheel here. There are a lot of people who get their mail delivered internally on a contract basis and it works fine, even with different volumes. Uh, if it if it's going to be uh, successful, great, we save money. If it isn't, we'll fall back to another position. The point is, our successes and our failures will be out there for everyone to see and comment on, and that we will have a third party backup as to whether or not the direction we're taking is a generally accepted and appropriate one. That's the fundamental difference between the old Congress and the new one. Mr. To say that the speaker through a hierarchical structure of responsibility has created this structure and that's not an appropriate one is to miss the basic point of the sunshine structure, the accountability, the accessibility, the responsibility, and the transparency that we've built into this system. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen from might, Louisiana. Uh, I would, uh, I would hope that uh, we would have a chance to move the agenda of uh, this committee, which is rather long, as you know, and you, you, I'm sure you understand that, um, in a way that gets us away from the, 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 the partisan discussion and the discussions of the 103rd and 102nd and 100 and whatever it was. I'm really not interested in, in going back over all that. I really am interested in these issues that you've put on this agenda today, and I really do want to get to those you know, as, as completely, and I say that quite honestly. Uh, you're not going to hear me sit here and talk about uh, the 100 and anything, or the, even the 104th. Uh, but I just am trying hard to understand what we're doing to employees, what we're doing to the system, and how we're advancing the cause. And um, that's really what I would hope to do. So I understand your position on the, on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Hoyer uh, amendment. I will have one probably that will just deal with bifurcation, since I understand your your, your opposition to uh, the, the uh, um, veto uh, issue in, in his, which I still think is an issue we, that is worthy of some bipartisan discussion. So I, I would hope that I would urge everyone, I mean, just let us move on on these issues. And it really doesn't serve any purpose, and it rankles everybody when either side gets into the We know that about all the, the historical stuff. We know it all too well. And I really would like to address it if, it all, if we can see ourselves uh, clear to just operate that way, it would be very, very helpful to me as one member of this committee. Tell the gentleman that everything the chair has said has been in response to statements on the gentleman's side of the aisle. If you go back and review the record of how this began this morning, it was not a complete recount of why we are where we are. But I will tell the gentleman, as he well knows, if there is an attempt to revise history, as I believe was partially done by the gentleman from Connecticut, or if there is a failure to understand how we got to where we are, the chair will make it painfully clear why we are where we are. I have every intent and desire to move forward in discussing the resolutions in front of us, but the chair will not tolerate revisionist history uh, without a complete understanding of why we are in the position we are in today. The resolution in front of us is the um, resolution dealing with uh, postal operations. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? And we have two amendments that have now uh, indicated are to be attached to this resolution uh, at the time that we vote on. The gentleman from Maryland, which we have in writing, and the simple one from the gentleman from Louisiana, which is simply to divide the question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, move the committee agree to the resolution. I, I, uh, um, okay, let me ask for a clarification from the chairman. Does the chair uh, wish to entertain that motion at this time, or does the chair wish to uh, consider the amendments prior uh, to that motion? Uh, I think, uh, given the way in which we've constructed it, and the ranking member is not here uh, to consult, that we would carry both of the amendments and the resolution, uh, and we'll bring them up at the appropriate time, in order, after all of the discussions. I'll simply lay them on the table, we will discuss them, attach any amendments thereto, and then at the end carry out a process of, 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 of moving each resolution, examining the amendments, and voting on them. Is that I withdraw an acceptable the motion, procedure? Uh, let's recess for the vote over on the floor.
It's the Collins Amendment. Oh, okay, it's just this one then. Yeah. This, is, this is, these are the C-SPAN mics. They're always on. We are still on item number two. The uh, Oversight Committee, I believe it's appropriate then that we would move on uh, to item number three, the resolution uh, authorizing the outsourcing of the House Folding Room. Uh, Ms. Carlson. This resolution would authorize the CAO to outsource the service of services of the Folding Room and it would set a date for the last, the last day for delivery of materials to the Folding Room by member offices would be August 11th and that the operations would officially close as of August 31st. <clears throat> would also authorize the incorporation of an assistance desk to provide advice and services to members, that that desk would be within the Office of Printing Services, and that we would continue to offer computerized mail mailing label services. It would authorize the sale and disposition of current equipment with the receipts from that sale, from those sales, to be returned to the U.S. Treasury. The assignment of the current space would be in conjunction with the chairman and the House Office Building Commission, and again would require the CAO to report to the committee monthly by the 10th of the month on the status of these operations. Mr. Faulkner, for elaboration and explanation. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As we uh, look at all of these different areas, this one is a classic case of the high fixed cost, high variable workflow. The chart which is the first chart in the packet I've given to members and is up here on the easel, reflects the kind of high variability. And as Mr. Ehlers said before the break, if you took the, the volume of mail being prepared in the folding room, that really reflects directly with the, uh, the cost, that when we have slow months, which in this case is September, October, November, and December, the cost can rise as high as $480.49 per thousand because you have a fully staffed, fully equipped, fully operational unit which is having virtually no work activity. On other months, especially as we start getting into, as you can see on the chart for 1994 and 1992 in the areas of like March and April, we actually are very competitive with the, uh, the industry. But again, the industry is competitive all the way through because they can vary their uh, work environment to the uh, workflow, which is something we cannot do. What I'd like to do to uh, go into a little more detail is to turn it back over to Ben Lusby to talk about his research on the matter. Yes, we contacted several mailing houses and, and gave them actual work from the folding room and ask for the cost. Uh, we considered the different kinds of mailings that are going through and we came up with a, an average of $15 per thousand. Uh, just in the way of comparison, year to date in 1995 through May, it's, the average is $36.21 and we're doing about $10.2 million. To break even with the, the outside cost, the folding room would need to do consistently about 22 million pieces a month. I think another piece to this which will be reflected both in this proposal and later in the printer proposal is that in this day and age where we have a situation of moving from one unit which relates to printing to another unit which relates to the preparation of mailing to another unit which relates to the actual mailing of the mail. Most industry servers are one-stop shops where a office can either fax, uh, FedEx, or electronically transmit camera-ready copy to a vendor who will then do it all at that one site. And that site could be here in the D.C. area, could be in the member's district, and the per unit price drops even further as you start to look at the clustering of those three operations in one vendor.
And so the savings continue to get better as you start to look at the what the private sector can do versus what we can do. Any uh, comments or discussion from members? Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the, uh, the, the savings of 4.3 million in salaries and operating expenses, is that the net to the House or is that the uh, net to your budget? No, and does not count the expenses that members' offices will have because they'll be charged for the mailing and folding services. That's a net to our budget. To your budget, but not to the House. Do you have a figure for what the net uh, savings is for the House? Total tax dollar. What the cost of the tax dollar? I believe if we use the fifteen dollars per thousand figure. The, the cost of the mailing that would go back to the members is 3.3 million if it went at the rate of 1993 and 1994. However, 1995 is going at about half the rate of 1993 and 94. And we were confident we can do better than that $15 a thousand. That was a high side estimate. Thank you. Gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. Mr. Ehler's question because it goes to my point in the opening statements. And a lot of what we're doing is moving costs from the overhead of the institution to the discretion of each member, which may have the effect of suppressing utilization, but also may have the effect of increasing the burden on the members. Uh, accounts which may well be uh, folded together at some point, but which may still be uh, inadequate to the additional costs. And I guess uh, one of my concerns in this area is the widely varying costs that members incur in this area. Uh, before we did the reforms, Congressman Frenzel and myself, we had huge differentials between what some members mailed and others did. We brought that somewhat closer together. But some members are doing mass mailings and others are doing more targeted mailings. Uh, it's a judgment call. And it will have different uh, impacts on the cost. Could you, could you speak to how current members in the pattern of utilization that you've seen would be affected by uh, the need to go outside? My assumption is that uh, the more you mail, the better your per piece rate. At the same time, the more you are involved in specialized mailings may be the higher per piece rate. And of course there is this question, I guess, of members acquiring their own equipment in-house, which would be at least an upfront cost to uh, do some of the smaller mailings. And I gather you also will have some sort of an eight-person staff that is not just doing procurement but doing some sort of mailing? Yes, sir. Could you speak to the variation of the impact on each member's office? We're going to have um, eight people to do the walk-up type jobs that are currently being done by the folding room. Um, these will be jobs up to 10,000 pieces. We feel with the eight people and some of the existing equipment in the folding room that we can handle that volume of jobs. Uh, some members don't use the folding room now, of course. Um, and, and you're correct that, that the larger the mailing, the less per piece. But of course, you have the postage factor added into that. Well, you have the postage factor as long as uh, you're doing it, uh, I guess, in the private sector, certainly in the campaign environment. But here we have a franking allowance, which it's still uh, money coming out of. Uh, it's, it's, you know, if you want to look at total taxpayer cost. But I'm afraid the member is going to look at it from the standpoint of the impact on their own office budget. And that may drive them to increase mailing, which is really certainly not the direction this, this committee has been going in, but would have the effect of reducing the cost to them per piece. In other words, we may be going more to mass mailings because it will be a savings rather than the more uh, specifically targeted mail, which would be more expensive. If you did six different smaller mailings to add up to the same amount of one large mass mailing. 
it would cost you a good deal more, wouldn't it, to it take depends. it depends. Uh, having done mass mailings myself, in both in the private sector and in the public sectors, the, a lot of times vendors, if they know that they're going to be having a number of mailings from the same client, mm -hmm. will give you that price break even though it may be coming in an installment. So again, those kind of negotiations as part Get of Get into a kind of sole source uh, relationship for a period of time. and Right. Say that I'm going to be doing 20,000 pieces of mail over the next couple months and they're going to be coming in at 5,000 increments. They, you still may get that 20,000 piece uh, rate. Again, some of those types of negotiations will be done member to member uh, on a member to member basis and that's again where the uh, uh, eight-person staff that is being proposed would help do that kind of bundling of services. If we have a number of members coming through at the same time, we can be kind of a, a matchmaker to help reduce costs. But is there any question in your minds that uh, despite the fact that there would be a net savings to the overhead of the House, your budget, there would be an increased cost for members out of their office accounts. I mean, there didn't seem to be much dispute over that. No. Members would end up paying more to go to the private sector than they're paying now, oh, and therefore so, more well, of their the folding account. room is free now to yes. members, uh, yes. Right. I think the issue is, is that we look very carefully at, at reforms that their only result was to shift from CAO to member accounts. What we were looking at is the total impact on the taxpayer, that regardless of whether it is a CAO account or a member account, what ultimately, when the dust settles, is the net effect on the taxpayer. Chairman, and would you briefly? Yes. Uh, I've said this in a number of other hearings, and it's just a kind of a nice thing to deal with, that we don't allow the use of free around here. <coughs> Nothing is free. The phrase, I think, that, that brings home the point is, at no cost to the user. Okay. And <laughs> the point the, 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 the CIO is making is that heretofore the members at no cost receive a service which certainly was paid for. The gentleman from California's certainly. point is well taken. They're now going to have to pay for it and we're going to have to take it into account in the overall a picture of the members individual accounts. Uh, we're going to monitor this carefully and as the gentleman indicated earlier there may be some initial changes to the members account structure which will assist them in that. But n none of us are going to be fooled by apparent savings from a centralized operation subsidized out of a general fund to the individual members paying for it out of their own fund, we are going to compare apples to apples in looking for savings. It's just that this is a proposal which I think you'll find will be supported by any reasonable audit, uh, and I believe the Pricewaterhouse audit is a reasonable one, that when you sit with that variation of volume, with a fixed employee base, it will just eat you alive on certain times and be inadequate on others. <laughs> and that's what we've had. Well, there, there's another approach, of course, and that is to take, uh, say, the recording studio, which I gather we're going to be talking about in a while, and say, let's figure out what the costs are to the members and then apportion those costs so that we compensate adequately the entity that's providing the service. It's probably going to be cheaper if we did that than to go outside on an individual ad hoc basis. Uh, you could argue that point, but at least the members would have the accountability of knowing what the costs were, but it might mean that we would actually attribute a lesser cost to the member's account than we might under the scenario that you've outlined. Uh, there is also, I guess, the, the questions uh, related to whether we want to produce more mass mailings or whether we think uh, more individualized, personalized mailings are really more the future of where we're going here. But there's also the analogy to electronic communication. And I understand that the uh, CAO is looking at the possibility of underwriting the overall costs of communicating between our district offices in Washington and I would think ultimately our constituents and so there is, in that case, a desire to pick up some of the basic costs, which vary and are expensive up front. Mr. Ehlers probably knows more about this than anyone up here. But it seems to be a different approach than we're using on uh, printing and folding. I think the difference is, is that a computer link is a flat fee 
whether you use it once or use it many times over. And so what we're looking at is, as part of this reallocation of costs, is to take those costs that are high, highly variable, which certainly the folding room is one of them, and moving that back to the members who have the full discretion over the expenditure of that money, and that for the, those parts of the information infrastructure that are truly fixed, whether you use it or not, that those are more likely candidates to bring into a centrally controlled administrative account because whether you're from Montana or New York, you're still going to have a certain link rate to your uh, district office. And Although so there's a good example, Montana's would be much greater than New York to Washington. Actually, when you get into the, like the internet links, not really. Really? Well, many of the members have not moved forward on linking their offices because of the great cost. Some have, however, found it maybe because they're in information highways of great usage, mm -hmm. cheaper. Right. There has been a distinction between rural districts and urban districts, right. for example. The, the state of the art keeps evolving as the technology keeps evolving. And again, we, we feel it's a very appropriate uh, way to go to have those kind of straight across the board costs borne by a central account and the high variable costs borne by individual accounts. I, I think it's accurate to say it's fair to treat all the members alike regardless of what costs may be involved <laughs> because their constituents all deserve the same mm -hmm. equal access in electronic terms. Right. Thank you. Any additional questions? Gentleman from Arizona. Well, we had the uh, two votes. Uh, I was relating to some of the members what we were discussing about today and talking about all the reforms, the folding, the uh, photo services, the uh, recording studio. Uh, they asked, uh, the question to me is, uh, you know, who's going to pay for it? And I responded, it's going to come out of your, your accounts. And they said, well, uh, right now we're almost into the middle of the budget year. And some of these uh, privatization, privatization is going to occur in August, some as soon as August, some later in the year. So well, what happens to our budgets? Uh, are we going to, uh, uh, since we're already six months into the budget and some of these expenses are now going to, that we weren't looking forward to, uh, how are we going to deal with our own personal budgets and the new costs? Mm -hmm. And I guess the message that they had for me was, is it possible to bring these reforms but bring them in uh, later in the year so that with the new budget then they can plan for them? Right. We've been working at length both with the Oversight uh, Committee majority staff and also with the Appropriations Committee, both, uh, both minority majority, to look at these issues because obviously the implementation, you, you raise a very important point, is that where, when is the switch over and what is the impact on on the appropriated numbers. And Tom Anfinson, who's my AA for uh, financial management, will be, uh, has been working extensively, especially with the Appropriations Committee, and can speak to this issue. This, uh, the committee would be involved in this process as well, but there would have to be a reallocation of funds approved by the committee and also the Appropriations Committee to increase those amounts. Each member's amount, or? The t total amount that would be allocated to the members themselves, yes. So each member would benefit by having the same uh, dollar amount added to their allowance. But again, it has to go through committee for approval. Appropriations committees. Yes. And oversight. And oversight. What, what, what are the uh, preliminary uh, indications? Uh... If we were to take the 1996 estimated increases that would have to be absorbed by the members, it would be roughly $11,000 per member. Is that on an annual basis? On an annualized basis. So, it would only so if we were to break that out for the rest of the year, it would be uh, one twelfth per month. So if we have uh, five, six months, maybe five or six thousand dollars. That includes the folding room, the studio, the photography services, That's and right. all the other changes. But it would be, <coughs> excuse me, yes. depend too on when that action actually took place. When the folding room would actually. Uh, close down and how much uh, the rest of the year would have to be picked up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tell the gentleman that, uh, as was the case when we did not personalize uh, mailing costs, there are a number of members who utilize the services extensively, a number who do not. My understanding is that, for example, the recording studios 
have only about a 10% utilization. Uh, and that what will happen is that some folks won't use them at all and, and others will. Uh, the idea of uh, monitoring now, being sensitive to the increased cost, and doing some counseling with members who perhaps utilize these services heavily, will be able to get through the initial period, beginning then in January, as I indicated several times. Part of that, we're going to discuss ways in which the members' accounts are going to be structured, at the very least, uh, to maximize the ability of the members to absorb uh, the increased costs that will be assigned to their accounts, which heretofore have been paid in a general way. We're very sensitive to that, and we're going to make sure that we monitor it so that you don't have somebody falling through the cracks or winding up going into the hole over a, uh, an assumed budget because of these costs that are at. Well, Chairman, you just for a second. Sure. I just wanted to tell my friend from Arizona at the moment, in the mark that uh, the subcommittee on ledge branches provided, mm -hmm which will be taken up in full committee, I think, tomorrow. Uh, there's enough money for the additional burdens that are estimated to fall on your office account if we provide no cost of living adjustment for our employees. Now, if we were to do that, we would have to about double the increase that was provided in this year's budget. So uh, it depends on how you look at it. You know, it's either there with steady state funding, no increase in COLA or there's a COLA and no funds to compensate for the additional costs that might befall your office account, even in its Thomas merged state. Let me also say that on this resolution number three, authorizing the outsourcing of the House folding room, Mr. Faulkner has indicated that the state of the art now is more for a standalone operation that does printing and folding and mailing all in one operation. Resolution number four is to terminate the contracts with the in-house printers. These two are not necessarily incompatible when we look for alternatives to replace something that uh, has been a kind of a separate standalone operation. We're mindful of that and the possible savings and are making sure that we take that into consideration as we examine uh, option number four. We currently have in front of us the resolution to authorize the outsourcing of the House Folding Room. Any other member? Mr. Chairman, just one more comment. Sure. Uh, I know that in this particular area of the Folding Room, we have uh, a number of employees. I think if you look at retirements and uh, sending people to other departments, we're talking about 77 people which is not, again, a great number, but I would, again, uh, encourage you that you do everything possible if we go this route. Absolutely. To, to help these uh, people uh, go forth with their life, mitigate the adverse effects, and hopefully leave them in better standing than they are today. So thank you. Absolutely. Mr. Pastor, would you yield just for a second? Yes, I will. Could you tell us how many people are within five years of retirement in the uh, folding room? I'm talking about any minimal retirement they'd be eligible for, let alone, you know, full benefits. I believe it's 31, sir. 31 out of how many FTEs? 119 presently. Uh huh. Is there any desire to deal with these folks differently? Is there any request for legislative authority, or do you have discretion at the moment? Do you think? Uh, yes, I think Kay Ford could talk to that better. Case here, isn't she? Yeah. Uh, still, yes. Yeah. I might intervene briefly. Obviously, the closer they are to retirement, the more willing we are to deal with a, a reasonable and humane settlement. The farther away they are from uh, <coughs> retirement, the less inclined we are to provide early retirement uh, in in a very uh, munificent way. I'm just interested in whatever Ms. Ford has thought of that might be helpful to people who might find themselves. Uh, without employment at the federal level, so close to having, you know, consummated a vesting. And that's why I said the closer they are, the more humane the consideration, Ms. Warren. We've done uh, a pretty good research on the ones that are close to retirement, and we have taken that into consideration. We've taken other th illnesses and other things into consideration also. Uh, we've also identified other uh, areas that uh, would benefit the employees that maybe um, under the, we got FERS and CSRS both, and we've identified which areas are beneficial to these employees. So we will work with them on an individual basis, but our intent is to 
work with these people and work the best way out for them. Is the assumption that the small uh, residual staff that would remain both doing small printing jobs and procurement would be made up of people currently employed there? I believe so, but Mr. Mm -hmm. yes. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Are there other jobs available in, in the congressional branch uh, that would be possibly available for people if they uh, were no longer to be employed in the folding room? Have you looked at the possible placement of those folks in other jobs that might allow them to continue their march toward a retirement? Every position that is available now in the office of the CAO is uh, advertised. Uh, several people that uh, have applied for jobs from other areas and they have s gotten jobs in different areas that their jobs were going to be abolished. So I can't guarantee it, but it is happening, not on a large You're amount. You're giving them any, any uh, advantage in the sense of having been veterans of service of this branch? We do not, uh, are not under that guidelines right now. Uh, it's the best qualified. And there, there are, and there are certainly people that are qualified. Mm -hmm. And certainly also as the uh, interviews and screening have taken place for these other jobs within the CAO, that institutional knowledge and track record is being taken into account. So it's not a, a mandated preference, but it's certainly, again, good management practice that if you have a, a person who has been a consistent performer and desires reemployment elsewhere and they have the skills to move that we would move them. I think most of us would hope that uh, if there are opportunities these folks would have the advantage of uh, you know having a preference over people called in from the outside uh, as long as their record is uh, a good one. I think you know there's a, a, a fear on the part of some because of the problems in the post office and uh, allegations about problems in the folding room that somehow we don't think these people are really uh, the kind of people we want to maintain among our workforce. And I know that that would be unfair to the vast majority of the people who've put in a lot of good years there. Absolutely, which is why we're taking every step possible to keep absorb them elsewhere in the organization. If there are no further comments from the members, we'll reserve the uh, vote until the end of uh, the hearing. The chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Majority and Minority Printers. Ms. Carlson. This resolution would authorize the committee to act to terminate the current contracts with the majority and the minority printer as soon as possible under the current contract terms, but in no event later than December 31st, 1995. It also incorporates a reference to the assistance desk within the Office of Printing Services to help members as needed to procure printing services outside the House and also requires the CAO to report monthly by the 10th of each month on the status of this operation. Mr. Faulkner. As you rightly said uh, about the folding room, this is really a related proposal to the folding room. It reflects once again both the state of the art, which is one-stop shopping, the uh, second graphic in your packages talk it shows really where things stand now where there's a lot of zigzags between different offices this costs money this uh, can create uh, uh, problems in terms of not meeting all the requirements of, uh, of the members it may also cost delays and so the result is is that what we want to do is to smooth out these zigzags Bring up the other chart to show once again the the one-stop shopping the state of the market is certainly that printers with the new electronic technologies are available everywhere if one opened up a yellow pages you would probably see page after page of printers within literally 10 miles of this this room as you start looking at individual member districts, again, you have printers nationwide to give advantages to just two printers here in the Congress is not cost effective, nor does it allow us to provide the flexibility of service, the timeliness of service, and ultimately, again, take advantage of the state of the art, which is the one-stop shops. 
Also, printers, a lot of printers have different uh, niches that they, their equipment is geared to. This would allow us to take a job and direct it to the printer or printers or mail houses that could do it most effectively at the, the best cost to the house. Any discussion from the members? Uh, I want to point out again, however, uh, that this resolution uh, primarily focuses on the fact uh, that the current contracts, majority and minority printer contracts, were not competitively bid. Uh, and that were we to uh, enter a competitive bid market, it's entirely possible based upon decisions that may be made uh, later in reference to the folding room and changes that might be made, that we could put together uh, a request for a proposal uh, that could provide most of or all of or an extension of a one-stop shop in the area for convenience sake. I know a number of members have indicated uh, there is a convenience aspect uh, involved. Uh, so that our primary focus is to make sure that we do not perpetuate the current system beyond the minimum requirements of the contracts uh, and that we then look at ways of uh, resolving, uh, once again, the extremely complex and high cost structure uh, that we have uh, for no reason in large part other than that's the way it's been done. May I ask a question? You may. Are you uh, are saying that, assuming these contracts are terminated, that they will, that the contractors now, the majority and minority printers, will be permitted to enter into a competitive bid process with whoever else might seek to provide the service? That's correct. If we, at this point, even though we have two printers in-house, there is no requirement to use those two printers, and many members do not at the same time and we terminate the in-house contracts there is nothing that prevents those two printers from being actively involved and in continuing to serve members they just will not be provided lease space the um, as you point out a member who wants now to avail himself or herself of this uh, one-stop shopping uh, new technology whatever feature that may be out there that someone wants to take advantage of can already be done now that is correct. And there's nothing in uh, what you're proposing here that makes that more available to a member, is it? What it does is it, we are part of the uh, customer service operation will be more aggressively helping members come up with one-stop shops because right now the folding room being intact, the in-house printers being intact, there is a, a lot of people are not looking or exploring the other options which are really cheaper to the taxpayer and to the member allowances. I'll tell you, uh, you I don't know how you gauge this, but um, uh, as we shop around, uh, the majority minority printers are, are really uh, competitive and more than competitive. They're cheap compared to a whole lot of folks out there. And I, I want to know, uh, yeah, tell me how you, you come to the conclusion. Could, could I comment on it? Yeah, I, I wish someone would. They are very competitive on small jobs, but they, they don't have the large presses that, that a large printer would have. And as the jobs get larger, then they are not competitive. But I, I agree with you completely on a small yeah, job. They're very describe competitive. Describe what you mean so I can understand about a small job and a large, large job that would involve a member. On a job, 10 to 50,000 they're very competitive. When it, when it gets over 50, they get less competitive. Well, most of the mass mailings that uh, most members would do would be over 50. And, um, and the experience I have is that it's, it's, uh, it's less expensive. At least that's, how, that's my office's experience. Uh, we don't have anything, uh, well, we never have anything under 50, I don't think. I mean, it's because of the household numbers in the district and uh, every mailing has been has been a, a mass mailing that's been generally available to every, every um, mm -hmm. household. We took uh, 20 jobs that the house printers had done, and they were pretty representative of the spectrum of the work that usually ends up in the folding room. And we took them out to local printers using the specifications that the house printers had. 
And we found, as I said, on the higher end, they weren't competitive. On the lower end, they were very competitive. But across the board, the outside costs we found with the printer was a dollar sixty-five more on the outside per thousand. Okay, and that included the mailing cost. It. Uh, um, it what about the idea? Of if everyone uh, was this Senate in, in one or several uh, outfits that had this capability to be this competitive, uh, were there 25 of these uh, outfits out there that could do this? There's more than 25. More than 25. Yes, sir. So in this area, yes, right, sir. That beat the house printer that badly? Are you sure about that? No, no. I didn't say they, they beat the house printer that badly. I said that, that overall, the outside costs, which included the mailing costs, were $1.65 per thousand higher. When we took out the mailing cost and went for the same bid, the, and we took the best bid, the lowest bid, for each job, and then we compared it to the printers, the outside printers were 7.7 percent less. And the 25 folks out there are 7.7 percent less. I mean, there are a lot of people out there. There, there are a lot of people out there, and, and again, we're taking the lowest one, the lowest price we can get. Okay, I'm just trying to get to the idea of, of the convenience and availability of all of these people who are supposed to be offering things at a low price, so that what, if members seek them, you won't be competing with uh, each other trying to get some, uh, some support from a printer. And I suppose these printers have a lot of um, other work they do out there, don't they? Well, actually, when you start looking at the printing market, and again, I've worked with printers uh, in the, when I've had my own business in the private sector as well, and they will do quite a bit to be very convenient to their customer. They will come in and pick up. They'll come in and lay out their uh, samples. They will work with you on price. They'll deliver. Uh, they'll explore the electronic transmission of photo-ready copy. So it's not a case where we're going to see a uh, staff member having to jump in a car and drive to Springfield, Virginia to drop something off. We are looking at printers who are very much customer-oriented because it's a highly competitive market. What about the, did, did you gauge the turnaround time versus the turnaround time of the... Uh... We put that in the requirements when we went out for bid. What did you find out? That we, we gave them three days, which was an average to print and mail, and their bids were based on that quick turnaround. What, did, what was the turnaround um, that the... Uh, I, I'm really interested in what the turnaround was, not on the basis of whether it was a reasonable time to turn it around, but compared to the, to the majority and minority printers. The same. That, that's why we put that requirement in there, because we wanted to compare apples to apples. And they stated to you that the three-day turnaround is what they shoot for? Yes, sir. The, um, is, are there any expenses involved with the equipment removal and that sort of thing uh, that, that, uh, that, that goes along with the termination of the contract? That, that we aren't, haven't talked about? And if there is, what is the, what's the cost? The printers are required to, to put the site back as it was at the beginning of the contract. At their cost. This new mayor, uh, there's going to be a mass mailing office left around, is what you're saying? It's going to be part of the printing services office. And how many people you have there, if, you, if it goes the way you want? Five additional people. And th there'll be... Um, what now, ombudsman, or what will they? We have two to prepare the list for members. We feel that's a service that we still need to do in-house. We have um, two to do the inventorying, the tracking of the jobs for the members through the office. And we have one main that sole job is going to be doing the specs and, and the purchasing. Now, everybody in the office is going to assist with that operation. Okay, last thing, Mr. Chairman, is how many jobs would be lost if the contracts are terminated of the folks who work here now between the majority and the minority printers' offices? 
Well, since the minority-majority printers are private individuals, those individuals are not on our payroll. Yeah. Well, how many of them are working down there? Don't tell me that then. Whoever, whatever payroll they are. I don't know. Again, we would I'm not be range. anticipating the. Uh, a again, it would be up to those printers. It is, just because they lose their work site doesn't mean that they lose their employees. They may relocate anywhere and continue to serve the Congress, especially if members feel that they are still the best printer around. And you don't have an idea how many folks. I just wonder how many there are. Whoever they, whoever pays them, I just. I would think that there's probably about a dozen in each shop. In my, in my walking around, I'd say that's a, a good ballpark. All right, thank you. Any additional comments? Uh, then we will uh, reserve this resolution to uh, the end uh, of the hearing. The chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Recording Studio Reforms. This resolution would reduce the scope of the current in-house operations of the House Recording Studio, requiring annual operating costs to fall by $1.2 million no later than August 1, 1995. It would also put a restriction such that members seeking election to any public office may not use the House Recording or Audio Studios within 60 days of their primary and general election unless that election is uncontested and the member's name does not appear on the ballot. This is similar to the ban on mass, the prohibition on 60 days before an election for mass mailings. As of August 1st, there would be a new pricing schedule which involves full cost recovery. The hours of operation of the recording studio would be shifted to only those days when the House is in session. There would be flexible personnel scheduling allowed. There would be greater itemized reporting of charges and utilization in the clerk's report beginning <clears throat> with the quarter ended September 30, 1995. It would allow the one channel currently allocated to HIS to be used for educational and instructional programming. We would close the photography op operation within the recording studio and transfer member ID cards to the sergeant at arms by August 1st. The house would continue to operate our own house floor video controls and the chairman would be authorized to take steps as necessary to transfer the audio controls for the house floor from the architect and the CIO will report to the committee monthly on his progress in these operations. Mr. Faulkner. Mr. Chairman, this reform proposal marks our shift from looking at outsourcing to looking at continuing the service in-house but in a different configuration. Again, as I've said earlier in my remarks, we did not go forward with a preordained conclusion to any of our analyses. In this case, the analyses both of the numbers of the use pattern and feedback from, from members and staff from a wide spectrum of the House led us to uh, this series of proposals. And I'd like to turn it over to Carol Cordich, who's my associate administrator on uh, special services and media, and Jim Davison, the deputy associate administrator for media services, to talk in more detail about their findings. I believe that this is another situation of high fixed costs and um, not enough utilization of the facility. <laughs> On the other hand, it seems that the facility needs to be here for the benefit of the members in looking at the usage. And the chart to my left shows the number of hours that the TV studio was available in 1994 mm -hmm. and the number of hours that it was actually used. But when we looked at the patterns for usage, what we found is there seems to be a correlation between what's going on on the floor of Congress and the demand to have members visible to the media and their constituents. And from that standpoint, we believe that we can operate this facility effectively, especially if we're given the right to use temporary and part-time employees um, to staff it so that we can cover the hours that Congress is in session, provide the members with the service that they need, and to still lower the fixed costs. Our commitment is to get the fixed costs down a million point two in the first year. Any comments from members? Mr. Chairman, I think that the uh, majority staff has looked at this uh, proposal and come up with some reasonable ideas that uh, I think accommodate the needs of members vis-a-vis -vis the 
amount of unscheduled time, and yet that peaks that we all understand occur. I think uh, generally, um, as it relates to the recording studio, there are so many other competing entities in the political side, and members are not even frankly clear about the law in terms of what they may take to one of the party offices or what they do here. I think the line is incredibly blurred. Even when you consult lawyers, you don't get clear answers. Uh, and so I think this is an area that's in, in total flux. But I know one thing, and that is that members will not utilize facilities that are at great distance. And breaking news is, is timely, and members have to be part of things that uh, the media is interested in, and, and vice versa. The media is only going to be interested at certain peak times. I think what I've seen put together here by the majority is a uh, reasonable accommodation of the problem that we've identified and at the same time a solution that may well uh, be even more broadly agreed to in this committee than some of the others we've discussed. Thank you, gentlemen, for his comments. And I want to underscore the Chief Administrative Officer's statement at the beginning of this resolution that we simply didn't take a cookie cutter to the way in which we handle the various functions that are in front of us. Uh, it's one thing uh, to deal with mail and folding of mail. It's another to deal with uh, a person who has to be, as we've seen today in four different places, at the same time only on particular days or particular times. Uh, and that utilizing um, a television uh, is no longer the luxury it may have been uh, in the 50s or even in the 60s. It is essential a part, and if we're to believe the polls, it is in fact the primary way in which most Americans get their news and information. Well, we see this then as a service facility, but as the gentleman quite rightly pointed out, and as that pie chart rather dramatically portrays, having a fully staffed operation, cooling its heels, literally, if you've been into one of these rooms that haven't been used for six hours, <laughs> cooling your heels, waiting for someone to use it, is probably not the most efficient way to utilize it, nor is it a way to uh, get people to um, support the idea that this is an essential uh, institution. We believe the changes that we're offering, and we will monitor them again as we go along, will save us enormous amounts of money with uh, little or virtually no inconvenience afforded to members on their peak time usage needs. And if I could just intervene, Mr. Chairman, I think the full cost recovery concept, which is really uh, at the heart of your proposal, is something that we may want to look at in other instances as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so, Chairman, just one question. Certainly. How many employees are we talking about? I, I couldn't find it, so I just. Uh, Okay. Now, when you say how many employees, how many employees totally? There are 42 employees allocated to the House Recording Studio at this moment. Uh, we're talking about doing the operation with 16 employees, and we believe that that is possible. And the remainder would be rift. Uh, yes, there are some openings, some open positions at this very moment. There are about six of those. So you won't fill those? Exactly. And, 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 and um, then the remainder of the employees would be rift, yes. I'm assuming that most of these people have some skills that are marketable. And Absolutely. Will... And as a matter of fact, uh, during the April recess, we pursued a program of cross-training to make these people more marketable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, no further comments. We'll uh, reserve the resolution on the recording studio until the end of the hearing. The chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Office of Photography. Ms. Carlson. This resolution would reduce the scope of the current operations of the House Photography Studio and reduce annual operating costs by a minimum of $325,000 by August 1st, 1995, and also as of August 1st, institute a new pricing schedule which involves full cost recovery. It would allow flexible personnel scheduling and shift work. And there would also be the requirement for a review of the current <coughs> facilities to recommend space and operational improvements no later than August 15th, 1995, and require the CEO to report to the committee monthly. Mr. Faulkner. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Just like with the recording studios, we're looking at 
very similar issues with the photography studios with a very similar set of proposals. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carolyn. Jim. In this case, our analysis was done on the number of hours that photographers were available versus the number of hours that they were actually used on photographic assignments. We believe that we can provide the same coverage to meet the demands, again, of the members to be able to have pictures taken at their convenience with less staff and no uh, reduction in the kind of service that's currently being provided. And that's what this pie chart is meant to illustrate, that we do have a lot of photography time where people are waiting to have something happen. Again, this also hinges on the ability to be able to use part-time and temporary employees. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as was indicated with the recording studio, that having members uh, bear more of the full cost, one would uh, better ac acquaint them with the cost of these facilities, uh, but also uh, create a, uh, a very nice behavioral relationship about the use of uh, the photographer and uh, right now, the, the lab costs uh, are, are nowhere near uh, appropriate uh, for the reproduction. Uh, again, it means that members uh, are going to be um, assigned a cost that they do not now see. Uh, but I just have to tell you, my other job is chairman of the Health Subcommittee of Ways and Means. And we've discovered that in the use of something like uh, health uh, services, uh, a copay on the part of the user is a very positive reinforcer for just how expensive these various uh, uh, um, uses are. And I guess this is analogous to that, that we're going to be looking more at a, a full appreciation of the cost of those photographs, which uh, I believe also are a part uh, of uh, the member services to constituents who, who visit them, but that we want them to appreciate the full cost of those photos. Some of the alternatives was to turn uh, every designated staffer into a photographer and uh, I've seen some of the work product of some of my staff uh, on film. On paper they're very good, verbally they're very good, they aren't very good photographers. Uh, and my argument is that um, a, a good photograph is better than a bad photograph and we ought to have more good photographs, all of us need good photographs. And that's why, once again, we're not taking the route that we've proposed with other solutions. It makes no sense at all to have some photographer uh, on a contract basis run up to the hill when you call them uh, or to pay for standby because when you do that in the private sector, it's very expensive on standby. Or if you make an appointment, they're there at the appointed time and you are not, you're going to be paying for pictures that aren't taken. Uh, and in addition to that, and I think quite rightly, the Sergeant-at-Arms was not excited about a different face in a different hall in a different office uh, every day with a camera around their neck saying, I'm here to take photographs. Uh, that's probably not the best way uh, to run this institution either. That's why we've come upon uh, this suggested uh, modification. Once again, the pie chart stands um, clearly as an example of what happens when you don't apply a reasonable management policy, uh, which is normal in the private sector, to the operations uh, in the government. And what the CAO has proposed is to do precisely that. Any additional comments? Mr. Chairman, I just want to say I think uh, very practically the solution that you've come up with makes a good deal of sense. If there's any uh, appreciation of the kind of helter-skelter existence we all lead here on Capitol Hill, I think you can understand the need to streamline the operation, but the, the private sector contracting concept, while in theory maybe an acceptable alternative, simply wouldn't work. The degree to which people are constantly readjusting schedules and changing uh, uh, times when members and constituents are together is just such a frequent occurrence that we would drive people who didn't have this sort of job on a regular basis nuts, um, which is probably what you'd have to be if you wanted to have this kind of job. But my hope is that we have tempered the proposal. Reserving to, to the right to object. <laughs> you have your right. <laughs> All I can say is I think uh, we, have, we have accommodated reality here, and I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen from Arizona. I, I was greatly disappointed that uh, we did not give greater 
consideration to option three, which uh, we provided all of us for the camera and training. And uh, but uh, in the new sense that uh, full recovery, do you think we'll be able to amend the uh, conduct of ethics where we may charge ourselves for some of these photos for the cost recovery? Uh, <laughs> I, think I see it tongue in cheek, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I think you'll find that there'll be a number of items added uh, in, in, in terms of doing business around here uh, in a way which I consider to be positive for people to uh, more fully appreciate. While we're going to be transparent for the taxpayers to see the cost, I think it's going to be enormously educational for the members to see the cost as well. Uh, and if there are no further comments, uh, the chair will uh, hold until the end of the hearing the committee resolution entitled Office of Photography. Uh, the chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Office 2000 Initiative. Ms. Carlson. This resolution would have the committee approving the Office 2000 Initiative in concept and would allow it House Information Systems to expend resources for the next step on, in developing this initiative, the first of which is the requirement for a schedule of milestones and achievements which must be approved by the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member and the computer working group. It would also allow the implementation and dedication of financial and personnel resources but require that that dedication be incremental, also subject to the approval of the chair, the ranking member, and the computer working group. It would require the provision that electronic data connections between member Washington and district offices with the cost of those connections to be absorbed and require the CAO to report to the committee monthly. Mr. Faulkner. Unlike the other proposals where we're looking at existing services and how better to provide them, in this case we're really looking at probably the most rapidly evolving service sector in the Congress, if not in the entire country, and that is information technology. Literally, as we've spoken here over the last few hours, new software is being developed, even new hardware is being developed. Ideas that are only in people's minds today may become commonplace in only a few years. I used to uh, start some of my training sessions by saying if people don't believe in change, how many people used fax as a verb ten years ago? We're having the same issues now with, the, with surfing the internet and other issues regarding uh, computer technology. We have a strategic choice embodied in this resolution. We can either remain very responsive to member offices as their needs evolve and to react to those needs or we can take a leadership position in terms of introducing new technology being able to uh, be a, to take advantage of economies of scale and to certain amount of compatibility of systems if we take a proactive stance instead of a reactive stance. The whole heart of Office 2000 is to be proactive and to get the kind of savings that economies of scale and compatibility will have. And so with that, I'd like to just turn it over to both Rick Endries and Don Mutersbaugh to add any additional comments. Good afternoon. The, the issue, Mr. Chairman, is, is one of, um, of three principal imperatives of driving the design of this, this project. One is to uh, increase uh, constituent communications, to create a better legislative product, and third, to uh, drive down the administrative costs of doing business in the House. We have, we expect to see some of our biggest and earliest opportunities in just driving down administrative costs by using state-of-the-art, off-the-shelf, paperless communication products, for example, paperless vouchers, paperless payrolls, <coughs> techniques that can drive down which we consider to be almost 25 percent of a, a member's time is spent, a member's office time is spent in administrative overhead. And we can begin to drive down those costs and begin to pay for some of this project. This is not a uh, this is simply industry best practices applied here in the House and on a carrot-wide basis, as Mr. Faulkner likes to say. Nothing here done uh, driving a member to do anything that he doesn't want to do or she doesn't want to do at their own pace. We will use a series of carrots that can help drive compliance as we move to more of a standard type environment. Any comments from members? Mr. Chairman, I would, I would just like for the record, uh, the 
latest organization chart as it applies to the uh, former HIS program and you know who's responsible for what and in and uh, ultimately what order I guess I know there have been some changes yeah well of course the next uh, proposal before the committee will be the reorganization mm -hmm. of HIS mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so we can speak to these issues you will as they we'll come get into forward. it when you get to that point yes okay I just I didn't want to be ahead but I didn't want to be behind right <laughs> I knew it was relevant mm -hmm. thank you gentlemen uh, uh, what we're talking about here is obviously a, a slightly a better coordinated uh, movement in the direction of computerizing uh, the Hill, and as was rightly stated by Mr. Enders in, in quoting Mr. Faulkner, uh, you have to look at every member as a kind of a small business enterprise, uh, and that although from a, a corporate model of everybody being in the same building, in essence, uh, you might be able to do a top-down requirement. Uh, given the diversity of the districts and uh, uh, the way in which members have fashioned a uniquely um, non-regimented business of uh, being open to constituents and responding to them in the way that the constituents and the member uh, believes to be uh, the, uh, the proper uh, procedure means, that we can't have some of the sta savings that we would if we could order a top-down uniformity uh, uh, of, of, uh, of materials. Uh, I actually see that as a, a, as a plus rather than a negative, frankly, because uh, when you're looking at it from a business organizational point of view, uh, it might make sense, but when you look at it from uh, an institution uh, which is a representative body elected every two years, and you have people getting elected and retiring and coming in, you would be constantly uh, uh, involved in reinforcing uh, the reason why you're doing it this way. And it pretty soon falls into the army argument of we do it this way because this is the way we do it. Uh, what we've provided for here US is a U.S. Army. <laughs> uh, actually, I, either analogy probably would work. Uh, what, what you have here uh, is all of the savings from the bulk buys, the single site licensings of software, um, the ability to provide minimum communication from most folk uh, with a minimum of the top-down rigid structuring. And so, uh, to use a cliche, it's, it's almost the best of both worlds uh, that we need, I think, to continue uh, to move forward to do our job. Uh, we do have uh, a concern, obviously, about as ambitious a program as to provide uh, one complete computer workstation to each office. When you begin looking at uh, some of the software purchases, uh, just give me a figure in terms of uh, utilizing software if we purchased it for most of the members of the House on a, on a one-site basis. I mean cost savings as opposed to... No, dollars amount that it would simply cost. We purchase... Um, well, today, every office, of course, is responsible for purchasing their own. And when you do that, uh, the costs are probably triple what we would pay on a, a bulk site license. And but that's the, the individual member paying out of their own accounts. And this, then, is a centralized purchasing. Where it makes sense to go centralized, we are, whereas today, each individual is purchasing it. Once again, no single model as to how we approach it. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars in some instances in terms of the purchase of uh, software. Yeah, we're, we're proposing to end the site license purchase of about $6.9 million, which is a, um, would be directly borne by the CAO's budget and not by the members and probably save the institution probably uh, anywhere from double to triple uh, that cost. And that has to be factored into the mix of adding to the members' accounts yes. versus items that are uh, separating from it. Uh, we do want to monitor this. That's why the resolution is perhaps not as cut and dried and structured as other resolutions. It is uh, a kind of uh, a, an ongoing uh, approval in concept with a check back in coordination with the Computer and Information Services Working Group. And I do want to get on the record. Uh, I'm sorry Mr. Ehlers is not here. Uh, but as someone who is charged with the very uh, great responsibility of overseeing, how is that for timing? <laughs> Can you ask for better timing? 
Mr. Ehlers, I was just saying I'm sorry you weren't here uh, because I was going to underscore the fact that on the Office 2000 initiative resolution, uh, although it says that uh, the uh, incrementally utilized funds appropriated for uh, HIS are to be approved by the chairman in consultation with the Computer and Information Services Working Group and the ranking minority member, I wanted to make it clear to everybody that in this particular area, uh, I rely enormously on the gentleman from Michigan and uh, the computer working group to advise us uh, on what seems to be uh, the most appropriate course to take. And with that, I'll yield to the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for my hopping in and out of this meeting, but I have uh, a couple of other markups going on, and occasionally they seem to want me to vote there, too. The uh, two resolutions before us dealing with House information systems are extremely important. The first one is to approve the Office 2000 initiative. Now, there's a lot encompassed in that term. The uh, CAO's office, in particular Mr. Endress, have been very busy on the Office 2000 initiatives, as they named it. At the same time, uh, the speaker appointed, before the year even began, appointed what he called the Computer Task Force to begin working on improvement of the operation of the computer system in the house and of course getting us on the internet as well. A good share of the internet responsibilities were concluded, concluded before January 4, but that work continues. The uh, task force became the working group and was assigned to work with the House Oversight Committee. So we've had, in a sense, two tracks for a while. I believe we are now on one track with the working group working closely with the CAO staff, particularly Mr. Endress. And the resolution asks that in response to a request from the CAO for approval of the Office 2000 initiative, that we approve it in concept, not in totality as submitted, but in concept. The uh, working group in the meantime has spent a lot of time and effort, and we are nearing completion of our work and hope to submit our report within the next month or two and incorporate the ideas from the CAO staff and also uh, many of the ideas from HIS, which is, of course, also under the CAO, plus outside advice from various individuals. And so I, I believe it's appropriate at this time that the committee go on record as supporting the Office 2000 initiative as being carried out by CAO and by the working group and that we continue to work together and uh, I think the way the resolution is written makes it clear that we are to work together and we're subject to the approval of the two gentlemen to my left and the approval of the uh, working group. So I recommend that this resolution be adopted as written. I have some uh, further comments on the next one, which I'll save until we get to that one. You'll have to get in line behind the gentleman from California. He's already indicated he wants to talk about that. Uh, any additional comments on the uh, Office 2000 initiative? If not, once again, we'll reserve that until uh, the conclusion of the hearing for voting purposes. And the chair then would lay before the committee a committee resolution entitled Reorganization of House Information Systems. Ms. Carlson. This resolution would approve changing the name of House Information Systems to House Information Resources and approve the new organizational structure effective July 1st, 1995. This would approve the staffing plan as presented, but would, would require monthly reports to the committee on projects, allocation of resources, and performance measures for the operations at HIR. The filling of vacancies and new positions are subject to review and approval of the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member. HIR is further directed to provide a long-term staffing plan to the committee by August 31st, 1995, and notes that the staffing plan establishes the maximum number of positions. Any modifications to the staffing plan, creation or elimination of positions, must be approved by the chairman in consultation with the ranking member. Mr. Faulkner, I'll do it before anybody else does. This is changing his to her. <laughs> <laughs> With, with, with no significance to that at all. Go ahead. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are really three items driving the reorganization proposal. Uh, the first one is really Office 2000, and even if Office 2000 was not approved, the changing, really rapidly changing nature of information needs of the Congress and the rapidly changing nature of the technology relating to information really drives us 
coming up with new ways of providing those services and the reorganization plan reflects those. The second is really driven by the transition where a group of people who used to work for a committee are now being moved under a larger organizational umbrella and the realignment of functions, the realignment of uh, positions and grade and salary are, need to happen no matter what else uh, occurs. And so that second piece of this reorganization reflects the alignment of pay and function and position description to be more consistent with a larger organizational structure. The third piece is really reflected by the chart I have up in front of me here. You know, to, I mean, to my, my right, uh, my left, your right, is the, the issue that the rapidly changing needs of information in the House and the complexity of those needs <coughs> requires a different organizational relationship. In the past and really right up until present, one individual within HIS has been responsible for serving 70 member offices. What this does is create a very reactive service environment. They literally have people who are very capable who are sitting waiting for the phone to ring. A lot of member offices are out there without much internal expertise and knowledge of what information technology is available, what ways one can organize workflows and information to take full advantage of technology, even the technology they may already have in their offices. We want to, with this realignment, create a 1 to 10 ratio. What this does is literally give everybody who is at a service desk the ability to have 10 people or 10 offices, kind of like a, their own territory, to go out and in a very interactive way, in a very iterative and partnering way, work with offices on really what is appropriate for their offices, help them make the maximum use of their existing technology, because in a lot of focus groups we've done, we've found that many offices do not take full advantage of the technology they already have and to help them explore other means, especially tying back to the Office 2000 initiative. So from the standpoint of, of customer service, from the standpoint of the nature of the technology, from the standpoint of just organizational realignment, uh, this new staffing plan makes sense. And I turn it over to Rick and Don for any further elaboration. Um, I wanted to, uh, to thank Mr. Andrews and the staff down at HIR who have been very actively involved in developing this new organizational structure. As you know, HIS today has basically six divisions that operate almost autonomously within themselves. Each division tries to provide full service to uh, the customers of the house, and it results in overlap, duplication of responsibilities, and so forth, uncertain responsibilities, and perhaps even lines of authority. Um, the actual uh, development of code occurs more from the viewpoint we can develop this in-house as opposed to we can pursue this with a off-the-shelf software type solution. Um, also in terms of even just responding to the problems uh, of the customers and so forth, there's no formal system uh, designed to allow us to track uh, the, the requests often, which don't even come in on paper, they're just phone calls, and uh, it sometimes does not result in the best customer service. Uh, another problem is also that um, the um, lack of a project management system, a life cycle methodology, a development methodology has also created some problems because you don't always wind up with the quality products because you didn't do enough responsible investigating at the beginning of it. So uh, the organizational plan that we are going to propose I think is going to provide a a quality conscious organization which will focus on customer service. We want to, to live the, the credo that Mr. Faulkner and our staff has got, which is we are serving our country by serving our Congress. And we feel this organizational structure will allow us to serve our Congress much better. And with that, I'll turn the details over to Mr. Andrews. Yeah. Any uh, member wish to comment on the reorganization structure resolution? <coughs> Well, I, I wanted to ask some Gentleman questions. from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, about the decision to make some significant terminations, I'm told that some 23 employees, mostly senior managers, are 
being terminated and I, I really wanted to know what the rationale for this was. I mean, there are all sorts of concerns that people have when this sort of thing occurs and I would like to hear, if I could, how we made the judgment calls. We have uh, apparently 275 FTEs in her. Is it simply a downsizing to get to that number? Where did we start no, from? The, the issue, and it will be coming up even more as we look at the, the overall reorganization of CAO, <clears throat> is that the organization as it was configured in December had numerous layers of management where you had basically the checkers checking the checkers and the supervisors supervising the supervisors, sometimes to the tune of six to eight layers. And you had then people working internally without much interaction externally to the actual customer base. What we're trying to do is flatten the organization to have more people directly tied to service to member offices. What that does is change the nature of the individual needed. It also changes the grade structure. If you have a person who's making $90,000 a year as a supervisor and you're creating a service desk environment that might only justify a $30,000 a year salary, uh, if that person wants to take the pay cut, they may, but they probably, given the nature of the expansion of information technology markets, they probably are going to find appropriate employment elsewhere at that grade level or higher. And we can then attract a younger person who may be more focused on the, uh, the service aspect of it to backfill. So that's the, so a lot of these numbers reflect the removal of senior management. Do you have a types. chart that you could show us of the prior structure and the current structure so we could yes. see how you have thinned the ranks of oversight? I mean, yes. Is there a possibility we could where, where would that be available? We I've have, got a copy of the available. I've got a copy of the yeah, the we'll overall chart right here, but I haven't seen anything that would draw us up, up into a clo closer focus. Question about nothing, nothing that large, obviously. But uh, yeah. he's not getting something I don't have, is he? Uh, these are things that are in the. I'll be uh, happy to share it with oh, you. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, these are actually part of the uh, the resume, or actually the um, the position description booklets that we put okay. forward to the committee about mm -hmm. a month ago. Now this is the current organization, and this is, I guess, a prior organization. It looks like there are uh, four assistant directors earlier, and currently. I see. You have client services, integration, operations, and communications. It looked as if we had uh, six where we have four, but then there were intermediate positions directly under the office of the director. That is correct. Are those the ones you're eliminating, essentially? That is correct. Plus, also, by creating more integration of the services by going from six down to four and bringing in telecommunications as one of those four as a broader client service area, we are also eliminating the need for additional uh, senior positions because now we only have four senior management positions overseeing divisions versus six seven. or seven when you include telecommunications. Could you, could you divide up the, the 23 people that are being terminated in terms of from what categories they, they come? Um, largely, there are seven deputy positions, uh, division managers have been eliminated. There have been three manager positions that were eliminated. And about 60% uh, about of all the middle management positions are now um, directly responsible for, uh, have been eliminated and go to directly to line work. So everyone has line responsibilities. There are no deputies. So that's about half the termination list. The other half of people who have skills that haven't kept up and uh, who we feel have a little opportunity for retraining or redirecting. But uh, most people were kept for uh, a long time on a kind of a wait and see list. So our desk audit was completed and we could do a full and uh, complete evaluation on everyone to see if there was indeed a job for them in the new structure. And if we couldn't find one, um, then they were put on that list. Tell me a bit about the desk audit. What does that really mean uh, and how is it? conducted, who performed it? 
we brought in an outside firm, uh, interdisciplinary firm, with an uh, uh, individual with background in mainframe and client server, and they, he worked his way through the entire organization, group by group, met with every individual, reviewed uh, their background, reviewed them with their managers, with their manager's managers, and then their recommendation was one of three principal uh, indicators that we use, the other being the recommendations from their managers as well as their personnel files, and that was all factored in to the decision. This gentleman or individual, because I don't really know anything about this person, what, what background did they have? How were they selected? Because it seems that they were a major player in determining whether these folks stayed on or not. It was remarkably helpful to us to have an outside objective party to come in. His firm, he has a computer consulting firm, has uh, close to 15 years of, of um, current experience going all the way, like I said, from the mainframe environment on. So he was able to come in and understand the organization, work with people on a on an individual basis, and it took them about two and a half months to complete the project. The proposal was for an outside objective uh, desk audit was uh, forwarded to the committee and approved by uh, by the committee, and then also the uh, the vendor was approved. So we, the other, could you could you tell us a bit about this individual, what credentials they bring, and how they were selected? Well, we followed the new procurement rules of the of the committee, and we have spent uh, a number of. Uh, Requests went out, not a formal process, but as a um, went through several vendors, looked at it for qualifications. We're looking for actually one individual to do it, not a team of people, because we wanted continuity to look through the whole organization. And he was the one that combined all those uh, basically integrated skills in his own background, so he could assess a very uh, varied organization. We can certainly provide a full capability statement and other client references if that'd be helpful. Could that, we have the auditor's notes and reports as well? It'd be interesting absolutely. to see. I, I realize that continuity is of value, but uh, sometimes people bring different perspectives. And, you know, if, if, if we had a given bias or, you know, bent on the part of one individual, it never gets sorted out when that individual sort of gets to be the first and last Right. Judge, that's my well, concern. Well, not the first and last, but one of three principal indicators. Mm -hmm. The Another part in terms of trying to identify the downsizing, part of the whole reorganization of the CAO and really the creation of the CAO was to create certain consolidated service shops within the CAO operation, procurement being one, finance being one, human resources being one. Some of the other individuals of high high dollar levels that are being removed from the HIR structure are going over to these other consolidated shops. So you would say in, in, in uh, conclusion that these people were selected uh, for termination in part because their skills in some cases had atrophied beyond the point where they could be immediately retrained, that they are in some cases uh, paid too much for the level of responsibility that they were ultimately given in the reorganization? In some those, those are the two major reasons? I well, mean, I actually, in some respects, that's kind of unfair to them as individuals because these are not, you know, bad individuals. <laughs> they are just no slot for them in the new organization. In fact, some of them were entirely adequate and did a very fine job the way we used to do business. We just could not find a, a job for them in the new structure. There were obviously some people who were competing for a similar kind of job. And uh, it was simply this desk audit that allowed you and the other management personnel to make the decisions as to who would fill those slots. No. We no? were all, that is just one of the, the factors. We had a task force made up of individuals who are longtime HIS employees who have been assessing uh, the flows of activity and the service needs and their uh, report was also part of this. Uh, again, we also were looking at what was going to be happening elsewhere in the organization, as I said, moving mm -hmm. the personnel and procurement individuals to consolidated <coughs> shops. And then again, the issue of which we're in the process of still doing of taking the remaining management positions since they are totally reconfigured from seven down to six, down to four, 
and working with the existing people to fill those positions. In fact, right now we are anticipating that at least three of the four positions will be filled by individuals currently in management roles. Mm -hmm. Did you ever reject any of the decisions of the auditor? The, uh, no, absolutely. This was a team effort, and I can say there were literally hundreds of man hours put in by the teams working mostly in the evenings and just working through. It was almost like trading um, in, a, in a draft pick situation where the different managers would be competing for different talent as we kept trying to fill the slots and then have people on a suspend list as we tried to fill them into appropriate locations. So it was probably... Uh, seven or eight people involved in this over a two-month period. I, I hate to bring it up, but Mr. Hoyer apparently did earlier. Is there any uh, potential uh, partisan affiliation aspect of this? There were obviously people with concerns that perhaps that had entered into some of the judgments that were made. From the desk audit perspective? Or from the evaluation that that contributed to? The only thing we know is the desk auditor has a Clinton sticker on the back of his car. That's the only indicator we have so far. Does it say uh, Clinton Gore? Or, or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, oh, there was, was one left over from a race in Arkansas years ago. You know? yeah. Yeah. Plus, yeah, the, no. other, the other issue yeah. is, is that as these functions have all been in motion, we have allowed people to compete into the new structure. So. It has not been a situation of going around saying, You're, you live, you die, so to speak, in the, on the org chart. We have literally created this new structure, and a lot of the desk audits have related as well to the functions and the salary levels that go with those functions, as well as looking at individuals. So we are looking, I mean, we even put an ad in the Washington Post and got over 100 responses to enrich the mix from the outside. So we are trying to make sure that when the new organization uh, premieres that we are looking at the best mix of the existing talent, some outside talent, and certainly an organization that reflects the needs that we're trying to meet. No ads in the Times? No, no, no just the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're that, looking that for the biggest circulation. closes me down, Mr. Chairman. There's nothing else I can add at this point. I thank you. I appreciate the uh, responses. Any other members wish to respond? Uh, Mr. Ehlers uh, obviously was anxious uh, to talk about uh, this. He's been involved from the beginning in dealing with the question. Uh, he was forced uh, to go to another committee, and it's too much to ask that we have another entrance as the, uh, as the last one. That happens uh, not even once a day. I do want to, though, for the record, in support of uh, Mr. Ehlers, indicate that um, uh, clearly all of the areas that we're dealing with in, in reforming here today are uh, people sensitive, that the, the personnel that we put in place will either make or break the structure. <laughs> but in no other area. Uh, do the people that we put in place probably play as great a role since you're dealing here not only with a servicing aspect and a management aspect, but a conceptualizing aspect which will become more and more uh, the central structure uh, of uh, a communication arrangement. Uh, HIS didn't exist a few years ago. It has grown kind of topsy-turvy without any real rethinking. We are now beginning the process uh, of rethinking, and the personnel aspect is critical. That's why I would draw the members' attention to the resolution that here, more so than anywhere else, uh, have uh, the committee indicated uh, that when we're dealing with personnel and vacancy uh, positions in this structure, uh, we would uh, like to be a little bit more in the consultative uh, structure uh, than in other areas. Uh, this will become the arteries and the lifeblood uh, to a very great extent. Uh, it's also a very expensive area. When you make mistakes, it's very expensive in this area, uh, and, and you live with them for uh, some time. So with that, uh, with that specific, I'll now uh, once again turn over to the person with the best timing I know. Uh, <laughs> The gentleman from 
Michigan, Mr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would have been here earlier except for the elevator problems here, and that's going to be the next on our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I won't go into the details of that. Just a few points I would like to make in addition to yours. First of all, the, uh, I want to emphasize in this resolution that uh, the positions hereby created are subject to reclassification, consolidation, and elimination by the chairman in consultation with the ranking minority member, and the ch chief administrative officer shall obtain the approval of the chairman prior to filling any vacant position. And I understand, Mr. Chairman, that uh, from conversations with you, that means that you uh, shall that your approval is required before someone is hired to fill a vacant position and that there will be review by your office. I further understand from consultation with you that that the uh, on line five and six that will be in consultation with the ranking minority member and the working group so long as the working group may exist. I just wanted to get that on the record. That's correct. Thank you. And the other thing I would like to enter on the record is that the uh, CAO's office has done a complete desk audit. It's not yet completed, but they're doing a complete desk audit of HIS, soon to become HIR. And that desk audit, I've been told by uh, both the CAO's office and by some employees of HIS, has been extremely valuable. It's been helpful. And for those who don't know, a desk audit does not consist of counting the number of desks, but rather evaluating each position and evaluating each position and trying to get a match between the person and the position. And so the reclassification re reflects the results of that desk audit. Something else I would like to get on the record, Mr. Chairman, and I have not had an opportunity to uh, discuss this with the CAO's, CAO's office since uh, this just occurred to me this morning, shortly before the meeting. But in view of the desk audit and the value it's had, I think it would be extremely useful that the same firm doing the desk audit also continue uh, with all the new hires that we're going to have, and there will be a number because of the realignment, and review the, uh, the applicants who are recommended for these positions and advise you and the working group in that, and that would include any current employees who are, uh, have not yet had a desk audit and who are being re uh, reassigned to another position. Gentlemen, you'll briefly. Uh, the question of the desk audit and uh, in some detail uh, the individual performing the desk off, uh, audit was uh, a subject of a colloquy between the gentleman from California and Mr. Andres, Mr. Faulkner, Mr. Munderspaugh. You, you just need to know that this gentleman has a Clinton bumper sticker. Uh, and if you're comfortable with the work he's been doing, we're going to continue uh, uh, that work. No. Uh, it was very helpful to get on the record the fact that although we contracted with an individual for continuity in the positions, that there was a real team effort in the evaluation, examination, and determination of his observations, uh, and that it continues to be uh, a team effort. Uh, and I think it's a good idea that as we go forward uh, in this, and obviously we'll have to discuss cost factors, uh, that if a desk audit was good on the old structure as we move forward, I think some kind of a similar evaluation of positions, because when you add one, others may change. This is so people sensitive that I think the gentleman from Michigan's suggestion is a good one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the point is simply, I, I think it would do great wonders for morale there to know that uh, they've been subjected to it, but everyone else coming in will also be subjected to it as part of the interview process and uh, an objective evaluation of their abilities will be made. So I wanted to get that on the record, and I assume um, CAO's, CAO's office will be in agreement with that since yes, they request... We requested, welcome any input. We re they requested the original desk audit, and this will ensure fairness all the way across the board. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for his comments. If there are no uh, further comments, we will then take the resolution entitled Reorganization of House Information Systems uh, and deal with that at the uh, end of the hearing in the regular order. Uh, the last item uh, on the um, uh, agenda uh, the chair lays before the committee a committee resolution entitled Reorganization of Operations Assigned to the Chief Administrative Officer. Ms. Carlson. This resolution is to approve the staffing plan as presented to the committee. The staffing plan establishes the maximum number of positions for each functional area underneath the CAO. 
requires that any modifications to the staffing plan, including the creation or elimination of positions, be approved by the chairman in consultation with the ranking member, that the filling of any vacancies receive the prior approval of the chairman, and that the CAO is to report to the committee no later than January 1st, 1996, with recommendations on further consolidations and efficiencies. Mr. Falcon. Yes, uh, we saved the best for last. <laughs> is this the mother of all charts? Uh, that might have been an overused al analogy a few years ago, but the, it is definitely a, a reflection of what we inherited back in December when the transition began to figure out the administrative services of the House of Representatives. Uh, you had fragmented authority, you had lack of coordination and cooperation throughout, you had an average of six layers of management before someone actually served a real member and member office. Uh, some places it goes as far as eight or nine layers. Duplication, if you started to flow chart it would zigzag all over the place, creating numerous steps that really were not necessary and certainly not value-added. Value added. The transition team back in December came up with an organization chart that reflected a consolidated structure, which of course created the CAO. And we took that chart as our baseline and worked from there to continue to flatten the chart to the point that again, the chart is in your package. It is over here to my left, your right, <coughs> where now we're down to two to three layers tops between myself and the person actually serving a member, and in most cases just two layers. This reflects a snapshot of where we'd like to be today. We, as we've said several other times, we are firm believers in continuous improvement as we continue to refine our operations, continue our analysis, start to see the impacts of these reforms today if they are approved we will continue to reevaluate and hopefully continue to flatten the organization. So today this is where we're at and we've, it, it creates savings of, uh, in fact, why don't we put up the other two charts. There is a, what this does is create net reductions and net savings. And first of all, in terms of the full time equivalent, if you look at this chart, you have if, if we go back and back out all of the people on the chart in front of me here, you had 1,013 and 93. There was then a uh, temporary uh, reduction in, in 94 to 969. Uh, it then drifted up again to over 1,000, and the budget projections that we were inheriting from the 103rd Congress had us going to 163 and actually climbing higher from there. What we've done is totally rethought the organization, and now we've moved it currently to, t to 947, and with this reorganization, moving it down to 641. We are, uh, this includes the 18 people who are revolving fund employees within the uh, daycare center. Uh, again, these are maximums. We see these numbers going, going down even more as we continue the refinement process. Any members' comments on the organization? Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just wondering if uh, you could uh, make available to us yes. uh, these well, uh, the, the, uh, charts. The small chart is already in your packet. The and larger the, mo one the, mo the mother now. also. <laughs> yeah. yes. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A gentleman from Arizona. Just a request. A, a request to Mr. Faulkner in the chart that was uh, up there before that had the positions. Is it possible that you could make available to my office and those who desire the names of the people occupying those positions? Absolutely. And Mr. Chairman, uh, another request from you. Uh, I ask unanimous consent uh, that members who aren't here be allowed to ask questions for the, to the record, for the record. No question. Any member who wishes to submit a series of uh, questions uh, in writing or verbally will try to make sure that they're coordinated. Uh, this again is not a, uh, a, a one-time performance. Uh, chair envisions uh, periodic progress reports and uh, um, successes as uh, well as problems. Uh, we want to talk about the positive as well as the negative, but uh, for these particular uh, questions, uh, certainly you may. 
Uh, for example, the chair notices on the uh, chart on the easel uh, that we have listed house information systems, and that is going to survive for another 10 minutes or so. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the CIO the has not anticipated the actions of the committee. He's quite rightly left it the way it is until we vote on the resolution, and then they're going to slap on a sticker that changes the name. I, I appreciate that gesture. I thank you, Chairman. Gentleman uh, from Ohio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Faulkner, earlier, uh, Mr. Hoyer had a copy of uh, the administrative structure, and he had these little dots on there, green dots, orange dots, uh, referring to some political orientation. Can you assure the committee that we're trying to find the best possible people to hire regardless of their political affiliation? Absolutely. In fact, the, uh, one of the first questions I asked the speaker when we were back in transition was, will there be any must hires? And he said no. And that has stayed current to this day, that we have not received directed input from any member, any leadership office, any committee to hire or fire anybody. We have also, I have also continued that process internally that each one of my individuals who are in management positions, there are no must hires from me. And so the result is, is that a wide range of individuals diversity of backgrounds, diversity of skills are being considered for each one of these positions. And we are trying to find the finest people we can. The House deserves it. Uh, I don't know uh, the accuracy of the chart that Mr. Hoyer held up, but there are an awful lot of dots on there. I don't know what those dots really indicated. Uh, but uh, uh, if there was uh, employment by a political committee, uh, or by a party uh, for the higher level uh, management employees in your operation, uh, I think it would be uh, helpful to the committee to understand that. I, I don't, again, you may want to take Mr. Hoyer's Yes, I'm document willing to meet and, with uh, him and any member of the minority to go over that chart and see whether it is accurate and to make any comments on it. Certainly, from the standpoint of the dots that might reflect Reagan administration or Bush administration uh, experience, certainly 12 of the last 14 years have been Republican domination of the executive branch. And people who have any currency of public sector management at the federal level would probably more reflect uh, re a Republican appointment as opposed to a Democrat administration appointment, even if they themselves were Republican or Democrat. I would hate to have a flat tax uh, discussion in my staff meetings, uh, but I cert or, or a Medicare discussion in my staff meetings, because we, are, we have lifelong Democrats who are serving in executive positions. Our debates serve more over the, uh, the ways to privatize, the ways to serve the members, and that's, I mean, we are, we are not partisan, and again, as we go through that chart, the chart doesn't reflect uh, Clinton or Carter administration appointments, and we do have them. Well, well I would point out that uh, as, as the member responsible for personnel during the transition uh, last November and December, uh, it was uh, my intention, and I think the intention of the leadership, to ensure that the administrative functions of the House would be operated uh, in a nonpartisan basis. Correct. And uh, I am uh, sure that uh, the leadership continues to feel, uh, as do I think the majority of the members of the committee, uh, that uh, people should be hired by the House based on their ability to do the job as outlined uh, in the, the description uh, for the job that's needed. And. Uh, and again, I hate to hit you with this. Uh, I, I didn't see the chart. I don't know what all the dots meant. It's looking like an awful lot of dots. Mm -hmm. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, you. Be happy to you. I, I can't speak for Mr. Hoyer, but sitting here while he brought the chart, I, I think uh, what the point he wanted to make is that, uh, as expected, and we realize that, uh, even though it sent Mr. Roberts into shock, that 
As expected, we would have uh, people hired by the majority of, of those people that have uh, participated in activities of the majority party. I mean, that, I don't think he was uh, downgrading that. He was just bringing to the point that there were, uh, that many times we, we don't recognize that and say that it was only on professional uh, experience or professional qualities. Uh, that's, I think that was the point he wanted to make. I, and I'm assuming, and I was told, that the dots uh, uh, go back to resumes that were provided by Mr. Faulkner to Mr. Hoyer. Uh, but I agree with you. I think that uh, there are services that, uh, uh, that deal with just maintaining the whole house, whether it be information, mail, and we would hope uh, we would hope that it would be uh, based on merit, based on professionalism. Uh, but we understand uh, that in some cases, uh, maybe there, there's not must hires, but there should be. Uh, there, must hire is not the term, but should hire may be the term. And we understand it, but we. Uh, well, we just want to be. Down. We just want to be fair about it as sure. we try to bring a more open and responsible sure. house. And I would note that uh, prior to January 4th. Uh, you could find hardly no one in the administration of the House that had a dot that would indicate a Republican activity. Uh, and I could probably note hundreds, maybe even more than hundreds, that had political affiliation on the other side of the aisle. But uh, uh, I think I've made the point to, that I wanted to make, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. And just to underscore that uh, at the conclusion, regardless of what color of a dot they might have or a party affiliation, the fundamental difference is that obviously we're looking for competent professionals and that the best ultimate check as to whether they're doing the job or not is not for us behind closed doors to make the evaluation, but to create a system in which the American people can see a transparent structure. I believe the Inspector General and the outside audit arrangement is the ultimate shotgun behind the door because no longer do you in consultation with other party leaders, be they Democrat or Republican, plan to not let people know what's going on. There is no way, as long as we maintain a fully funded and staffed Inspector General with a periodic outside audit, that if there is a problem in the people's house, it won't come forward. Uh, and frankly, it's overdue. Had we had an exchange of party control of the House as the Senate did or as the presidency uh, has, frankly, these changes in many ways would have been made uh, prior to now. Uh, I do want to underscore the fact that in many, many of these initiatives, uh, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle join us wholeheartedly. That will be evidenced by a portion of the votes that we will take on the resolutions. Uh, and I'm advised that we have less than five minutes um, of debate left on the floor of the House prior to uh, the recorded vote on an amendment. Uh, the chair would then um, entertain a recess until 3 o'clock, at which time we will begin voting uh, on the resolutions. And the chair urges all uh, staff to make sure that all the members who wish to participate in the recorded vote uh, are, are here at uh, 3 p.m. So the committee stands in recess until 3 p.m. As indicated by uh, mutual agreement, having um, heard, debated, discussed uh, the uh, resolutions uh, on the part of the members uh, by uh, unanimous consent we were then to take up a voting on the resolutions uh, after all uh, debate had ceased and we've reached that point. Um, chair wants to indicate that on the first resolution there was a roll call vote uh, on the first resolution. Um, the chair recalls it was 8-1. We'll let that stand. Um, the second resolution to authorize issuance of an RFP or a request for uh, a proposal for the House Postal Operations 
uh, there was indicated uh, by the minority that two amendments were to be in order. A uh, gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Jefferson, had indicated that he wanted to divide the question. And the um, chairman's understanding of the rules are that if a motion is divisible and a request is made, then that motion is divided. There is no formal requirement to do so. The chair's assumption is the gentleman from Louisiana wanted a separate vote on the fourth resolved clause on page two, uh, which was the uh, establishment of the window facilities uh, with the United States Postal Service, and that that would be a separate vote. That's right, uh, Mr. Chairman. Then let's do that at this time. Uh, the motion is that the fourth resolved as a standing alone uh, resolve uh, be passed. All those in favor? Aye. Now uh, we're going to do roll call. Mr. Ehlers? Aye. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. Diaz Villard? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will announce the results. Eleven members have voted in the affirmative. Uh, there being eleven yeas and uh, zero nays, the, that portion of the resolution passes. Uh, if you'll take the rest of the resolution conceptually, my understanding is, oh no, we have a written amendment from a gentleman from Maryland having to do with removing the in consultation with and, and uh, adding and the effect of the amendments in the three instances would uh, uh, create a veto power uh, for the ranking uh, minority member uh, in any decision that might be made by the committee. Chairman, could I characterize it a little more positively? It would simply mean that they would act together jointly in a cooperative, positive fashion. Thank the gentleman for the <laughs> different slant. Uh, the amendment would elevate the ranking member to an equal position with the chair. I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on which direction he would go. I'd appreciate it if you tried. These activities would take place in consultation with uh, the ranking minority member, and uh, considering how this committee used to operate out of the box back pocket of the chairman, uh, I think that uh, we're being overly fair, open, and uh, uh, taking into effect who, who the opinions of the minority. Gentleman Happy to you. You know, I, I hear a lot of uh, reviews of history here, and I know the gentleman uh, oh, here we go again. You know, doesn't uh, wish to portray the past in anything but an accurate version. I just want to pass along my version of the past as compared to the present is, frankly, that there was far more consultation with far more advance notice on a large number of issues in the past than there are today for members of this committee. Oh, so, In reclaiming you know, my time, Mr. Gadenson, now, many of us sat on the old House Administration Committee, and we know that uh, in 1994, as an example, the House Administration Committee had how many hearings, meetings, one or two, for the entire year? And that's because a lot of decisions were made outside uh, of the committee process. And what you'll notice is that what we're trying to do is to bring these issues before the committee so that all members can participate. And I think that this is Will a great gentleman improvement. Will the yield? I'd be happy to yield. I think maybe what we ought to do just to go through this history at some point, not today, is get former Chairman Rose here and Mr. Thomas, who was the ranking member at that time, and review some of their procedures, how often they consulted with each other. And how often Mr. Con Mr. Thomas now feels the need to consult? In reclaiming my time, it sounds rather unproductive at this moment. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, on a, on a perhaps more serious, I understand all the history, and, and uh, I want to tell you and repeat, I think the way that was handled in the past was not the way it should be handled. Um, there's a marked difference in the makeup of this committee. Maybe that's because there is a feeling but it needs to be handled in a productive fashion. I want to tell you, I don't think this amendment's going to pass. I, and if I were on your side, it probably would, we would probably vote against it. Uh, but I did not offer it uh, as, a, as a negative 
uh, or as an accusatory. I really do think there's a value for us to get away from this he did it, they did it uh, context when we're running the House of Representatives. It redounds to the benefit of every Republican and every Democrat, all 435 of us, if this place is perceived to run well, efficiently, and honestly by the American public. And I really do believe that, and I think that's our objective. I think all the rest is junk. Uh, you know, I, most, I will tell you, there's no member sitting around this table who has more employees going to be personally affected by any of the actions we take here. Uh, that's not my drill. They'll all, I'll help them find jobs or whatever. What we need to do is make sure this place runs well, and we will all benefit from that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The vote is on the gentleman from Maryland's uh, amendment, which in the first, third, and fourth resolve clause uh, strikes uh, in consultation with uh, and uh, places and therein. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Ehlers? No. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? No. Ms. Dunn? No. Mr. diaz Bullard. No. Mr. Ney? Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Five members having voted in the affirmative and six members voting in the negative. Uh, the amendment fails. Uh, five yeses and six noes. Uh, we'll then vote on the remainder of the Postal Operation Resolution, having already passed uh, the post office portion. <coughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Yes. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. diaz Villar? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? No. Mr. Gadenson? No. Mr. Hoyer? No. Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? No. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Six members have voted the affirmative, and five members have voted the negative. Uh, the vote being six to five, the rest of the resolution passes, so the entire resolution uh, then passes. Uh, the next resolution before us is the Publication Distribution Service changes. Members familiarize themselves once again with that resolution. If there are no questions, then the... Mr. Chairman, I just yes. want to say I think the model that you've used of uh, full cost accounting, which will cause me to vote aye on a number of uh, resolutions later on, should be first tried on this one. Uh, before we went as far as this resolution would go. I do understand the need for uh, adjustments and change there, but I just wanted to be on the record. Thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a resolution dealing with the um, folding room. That's correct. Well, may I join with a ranking member and say that uh, what troubles me a great deal is that um, we heard a lot from the uh, witnesses who appeared before us about their having offered uh, the employees an opportunity to uh, uh, to find another job, to offer assistance and all the rest of it. I spent a lot of time out here in, in, the, in the hallway uh, and uh, in the basement talking to uh, folks who wanted very much to have a chance to say that that wasn't really what happened and it hasn't happened yet and that they're very concerned about that. And I worry about not having heard from their side on this issue at all. I just want to say that. I know we're down the road on this, but that would support, I believe, what, uh, what our ranking member is talking about now. We do need to go slow on this because it would help, I believe, to... Uh, we have people who, 15 years, I talked to someone, someone who has 11 years, someone who has uh, seven years. That's a, that's a substantial time on the job. And, and uh, they've worked, they, they got trained there, worked the, themselves into supervisory jobs in some cases, and uh, they do important work for which they've become highly skilled. They have not been hurt. Uh, before this committee. And uh, uh, I think it's, it, before we do this, it would be important to hear from these people. They are real people who, who do need to be heard. Uh, I, I would just say that before we begin to debate every one of these resolutions over again, the agreed upon procedure was to hold the hearing, have the discussion, ask the questions, and then vote on the resolutions. 
chair is restrained to allow people to make a comment or two because there was a time separation between the discussion and the resolution, but the chair uh, is not going to uh, allow a complete uh, re-debate uh, of uh, each uh, resolution. And all of these resolutions need to be taken, uh, uh, read in light of the first resolution, which um, uh, passed, I believe, no, there was one negative vote, uh, virtually unanimously in terms of setting up um, a, a uh, employee assistant structure, which has never been present uh, before at all. Uh, the vote is on the resolution Mr. on Chairman, public I, I don't want to debate them, but I do want to say, quite obviously, a number of these resolutions would be subject to the same amendment that I offered on the first Correct. and the second one. I'm obviously not going to, uh, the vote would be six to five again, I'm not going to offer it to everyone, but I would make uh, the point simply that I think they're applicable to each one. And I, I appreciate the fact that there is good consultation. The ranking member has made it very clear to his uh, four Democratic colleagues that you have been very open and uh, with him and have uh, had full consultation with him. And uh, we would emphasize that we're pleased at that, would offer the amendments, understand the result. Thank the gentleman for uh, the manner in which he is proposing it. Uh, and I fully understand the manner in which he's presenting it. Uh, as he well uh, knows in the position that I was previously, I had offered uh, the same uh, amendments with the same results. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Chairman, a point of parliamentary inquiry. Do you, do you want, wish to have a motion? Uh, I believe that I thought we said at the beginning that we were placing all of these uh, before us as motions, but uh, if, I can ask for a motion if you want to. Uh, I, offer I, no, one. I just want to make sure that we're doing the thing right. And also, um, the technical and conforming changes that those will be made possible. We're going to make a statement at the end Great. for all of them. Uh, motion in front of us is the resolution entitled Publications Distribution Service. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Aye. Mr. Roberts? <coughs> Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. diaz Bullard. Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? No. Mr. Gadenson? No. Mr. Hoyer? No. Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? No. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Six members voting in the affirmative, five members voting in the negative. Uh, the vote being six to five, the resolution, the motion on the resolution entitled Publication Distribution Service um, is passed. Uh, the chair would uh, then entertain the motion on uh, the majority and minority printers resolution. Remember that one? It's the idea of uh, Mr. Chairman, competitively I'm the contracting. With the, resolution. the motion has been made by a gentlewoman from Washington. Uh, to agree to the resolution. Uh, Can Kirk I ask will a call. question on that? Certainly. I wasn't here for that. Sure. Uh, in, in looking at the explanation, to terminate them uh, as early as possible, but no later than December 31st, are there any contracts that exceed that date? And if so, what do we do about that? The contract structure is a minimum six months uh, notice. The so assumption none of them is that if we do close down uh, the folding room by August 31st, there may be a possibility of business being redirected and they may wish to voluntarily close uh, or terminate the contract prior to that, but that the December 31 is the, is the minimum latest. contract requirement of the six month period. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. <coughs> Mr. diaz Bellard. Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? I'm voting with the last two people. Yes. Mr. Gadenson? No. Mr. Hoyer? No. Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Clerk will announce the vote. Eight members have voted in the affirmative. Three members have voted in the negative. A, a vote being eight to three, the uh, motion on the resolution entitled Majority and uh, Minority Printers is passed. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion from the gentlewoman from Washington on the recording studio reforms. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee agree to that resolution. Pause for refreshing on the uh, resolution. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Yes. Ms. Dunn? Aye. 
Mr. Diaz Villar? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Mr. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Eleven members have voted in the affirmative. Uh, the vote being uh, 11 ayes and no noes, the resolution, uh, motion on the resolution on the recording studio uh, reforms passes. A uh, gentlewoman from Washington. Mr. Chairman, I move the, um, the committee agree to the resolution to downsize and reform operations of the House Photography Studio. Uh, the motion is on the resolution on the Office of Photography. Chairman, again, I apologize. It says downsize uh, uh, by at least 325. What is the current budget? What does that reduce it to? Seventy-five. So this reduces it by approximately sixty percent. Uh, that's personnel, five seventy-five. Uh, there is an enormous cost. I think it's over a million dollars in terms of the lab costs associated with the Office of Photography, uh, and uh, we're talking about creating a. Um, a more no, honest pass-through cost structure as well. Uh, a gentleman might be um, interested in a pie chart which indicated the number of hours folks were available versus the number of hours that people used them. And I'm pleased to say that there was more utilization of the photographers than there was of the recording studio. And I understand the gentleman was not here at the time we discussed those resolutions. I was not here, but right. thank you very much for the Certainly. Uh, vote is on the motion on the Office of Photography. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. diaz Bellard. Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. No. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? No. Mr. Hoyer? Pass. You think so? Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Mr. Chairman, I vote no. No mission votes no. Three members have voted, excuse me, eight members have voted in the affirmative, three members have voted in the negative. Uh, the vote being uh, eight ayes and three noes, the motion on the Office of Photography. Uh, is passed. A gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee agree to the resolution. Uh, the resolution being the Office of 2000 Initiative. The motion is on Office 2000 Initiative Resolution. Do you remember which one that was? <coughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellart? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will read. members have voted in the affirmative. Uh, there being 11 ayes and uh, no noes, the motion on the resolution entitled Office 2000 Initiative is passed. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I uh, move that the committee agree to the resolution to approve staffing, reorganization, and renaming of House or information systems be passed. Resolution on the reorganization of House information systems, renaming it to uh, House information resources, and providing staffing um, subject to the approval of the chair in consultation with uh, the ranking minority member and uh, the computer working group. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Aye. Ms. Dunn? Aye. Mr. Diaz Bellart? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? Aye. Mr. Gadenson? Aye. Mr. Hoyer? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Mr. Pastor? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will announce the vote. Eleven members have voted in the affirmative, zero members have voted in the negative. Uh, the vote being 11-0, the motion on the resolution entitled Reorganization of House Information Systems passes. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee agree to the resolution to approve staffing and reorganization of operations under the Chief Administrative Officer. 
This is a resolution on the reorganization of operations under the CAO. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Boehner? Yes. Ms. Dunn? Yes. Mr. diaz Villar? Yes. Mr. Ney? Yes. Mr. Fazio? No. Mr. Gadenson? Nope. Mr. Hoyer? No. Mr. Jefferson? No. Mr. Pastor? No. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Clerk will announce the vote. Six members voted in the affirmative, five members voted in the negative. Uh, the vote being six to five, the motion on the resolution to reorganize the operations assigned to the Chief Administrative Officer passes. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes in all the resolutions which have been adopted. Uh, without objection, the Chair would very much like to uh, thank the members uh, for uh, being able to accommodate as much as you were uh, this particular hearing. We have passed a, a series of significant changes in the House of Representatives, and I want to especially thank the minority for being a, a positive uh, alternative without creating uh, unnecessary harassment. This is the uh, structure in which I hope we'll be able uh, to operate as we make important changes, and we value and appreciate your input. Could the chairman enlighten me? I'm, I'm very pleased at his comments, and I thank him for that. Uh, would, he, would he inform me when the necessary harassment is in order? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate and thank you as for unnecessary harassment, but I'm ready for necessary harassment whenever the chairman feels it's in order. The gentleman needs necessary <laughs> harassment to find he's far less than I think he's capable of, and he's going to provide not only necessary, but uh, tinging on the unnecessary harassment as well. Thank you all very much. I understand necessary harassment. Uh, sure, if you just have a couple minutes, maybe just uh, go over With who? The House of Representatives next meets tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. Members will continue debate on a defense spending bill. Live coverage can be seen here on our companion network.